actually having today relationships with 164 states of the 193 states that are registered at the UN. Uh, you're talking about 85%. Uh, as you know, the picture is changing nearly daily. Uh, only lately we signed, uh, as part of the Abraham Record, a code to sign the uh, peace agreement with the UAE, another one with Bahrain. Uh, some others might follow. I'm sure you are following the news. I don't want to speak about it too much, but uh, as you can see in the map, uh, uh, two blue dots along the Gulf, uh, the, the, along the Arab or Persian Gulf, those are UAE and Bahrain. Uh, all the blue states in the map are states that Israel has diplomatic relationship with. As you see, we still have some challenges uh, with Cuba, we don't have relationship yet uh, with Venezuela, not, but most of our challenges are also with the two big Muslim states, Indonesia and Malaysia, which are on the east side of the map, we don't have relationship yet, but no, of course with North Korea, but most of our challenges are in the Middle East, and in North Africa, you can see plenty of uh, uh, purple colors, uh, in the Sahel, Sahel, but this is, as I said before, this is a changing map, a changing picture, and this map that you see now is already very different from the map we had only a few months ago. We have here the UAE, we have here uh, Bahrain, and again, in a month or two, we might have a, a different map with some other Middle Eastern countries, and with some other North African and Sahel countries. Again, I'm sure you're all following very closely. Uh, Israel has currently uh, like 103 missions all over the world to represent our interests in all those worlds. Some of the countries, some of the uh, embassies cover more than one state, or like in Turkey, that we have actually two missions. We have the embassy in Ankara, so I'm heading, and we have the consulate in in uh, Istanbul, so because Turkey is such an important state, we have actually two missions. Let's move to the next uh, slide. Now we start to talk about the business, about the principles of foreign policy. Uh, I didn't mention all the principles during this slide, and the next slide I will mention five principles. Again, uh, I think there might be more. Those are the five that I thought are the most, most important. The first one is solid relationship with at least one global superpower. I'm talking about strategic alliance with the USA and good relations also with Russia. Now that has to be said. Uh, this is something which is easier said than done. But Ben Gurion, ben -Gurion who was our first uh, uh, prime minister, uh, as you know, the state of Israel was established in 1948. He actually had to make a very difficult uh, strategic decision. Israel was basically, a, a, I would say, uh, built uh, by people that came mainly from Russia or from USSR at the time. Uh, nevertheless, Mr. Ben uh, 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 he understood that the very uh, uh, early time of the state, and this was still the Cold War between the USA and the USSR, that Israel has to have at least, at least one strategic partner next to it, and he chose that that should be the USA and not the USSR. He was born in Poland, he was more close to, I mean, to his birth to the USSR, but he realized that if you are checking through the values, Israel has to invest in the USA. And since then, Israel has strategic alliance with the USA. Nowadays, I can say that after the end of the Cold War, where we had also very tense relationship with the other superpower, which was Russia. Now we have very decent relationship between Israel and Russia. Prime Minister Netanyahu speaks often with uh, President Putin, and I think in that sense, we are in a good place. Um, second uh, uh, principle I would like to mention is uh, the need to be pragmatic. Again, uh, it sounds obvious, but it's not as obvious as it is. Uh, the need to avoid isolation. We've been isolated as a state for too long time. Actually, Israel was born in 1948, but only in 1955, only in... Can you hear me now?
We cannot hear you, nothing, we can hear nothing, please stop. Can you hear, uh, okay, can you hear us now? Can you see? Yes, okay. it's, it's very well now, it's very okay. well now. Okay, thank you very much. I, I hope you did manage to hear a... I hope you did, you did manage to hear uh, my presentation so far, but if, yeah. if, the, if the voice wasn't very clear, then now we are actually getting to the heart of the business. So uh, I spoke about the second principle, which is uh, the need to be pragmatic in order to avoid isolation. Again, it sounds obvious, but it's not as obvious as that. Israel was born in 1948, only in 1955, seven years after the state was born, we had the first visit of a leader of the state. This was Mr. Unu, the uh, president of uh, the time Burma, today is in Myanmar. Uh, and it took us seven years, seven years to see the first uh, visit of the leader in Israel. Another, uh, another period of isolation was uh, immediately after 1973 war, that when all African states, short of three, short of South Africa and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Swaziland and Malawi, all the rest uh, cut relationship uh, with us uh, because of the war and because what they claim that Israel has occupied a part of Africa. And it took us a long time until the mid 80s. Uh, I was actually part of it. I served in Kenya. Uh, between uh, 1981 and 1984, and I saw how all those states that cut the relationship with Israel uh, after the 1973 war renewed the relationship. But between 1973 and 1980 war, 1981 or 1983 and 5, our relationship with the states were cut. So uh, the need to avoid this isola isolation through a pragmatic foreign policy is very important for us. And indeed, as you all know, now Israel is part of many blocks in the East Med uh, and others, and we'll speak about it later on. The third principle is the need to balance national interest with values, values like democratic values, human rights, freedom of expression, and so on. Uh, I, I, I highlighted this uh, principle mainly because I think, as I guess you all have learned from Professor Bakti as a student, the first thing that eventually that uh, is setting the foreign policy of the state is the national interest. That has to be said, just like every person, also every state has a national interest and the foreign policy has to serve those national interests. However, uh, this national interest-based uh, uh, policy cannot ignore values. And the values that Israel uh, uh, believe in, in democracy, human rights, freedom of expression, uh, and so on, should also balance our uh, uh, foreign policy. That is to say, uh, you should not have a relationship uh, with, a, with a state that its uh, policy, uh, domestic policy, is going very strongly against those values. Now again, this is another principle which is uh, easier said than done. Some of those states are very important for our security. So how do you balance between the two? I'm not going to give an answer to this uh, question in this presentation. I'm only, only going to draw your attention to the fact that this is a very important, important balance that we have to strike day in and day out. Uh, let's move to the uh, next slide. Um, combination of hard power and soft power. Uh, by saying hard power, I mean mainly uh, the, the might, the power, the strength of the IDF and the deterrence of the state of Israel as a, as a strong state. 
And by saying soft power, I mean a high tech uh, energy. I have a feeling we are going to discuss energy later on as well. And uh, the Israeli aid mashab, I'd like to say a word about it. I don't know how many of you know, but we have a very strong institute to a, a market and to send Israeli, uh, I would say, uh, know-how all over the world. When it started in the early 50s, it was mainly uh, a, a agriculture. Then it moved into other issues like uh, today, uh, cyber and high tech. And uh, you'll be maybe surprised, but there are many, many people in uh, uh, Turkey as well who studied in Israel. Sometimes we send our experts abroad. So maybe some of them studied with Israeli uh, uh, experts here. So the combination of hard power and soft power, I would say, is another basic uh, element in our foreign policy. Last but not least, the fifth uh, uh, pillar, I would call it, is the responsibility for Jewish communities all over the world. Now, this thing has to be uh, understood. Israel is a Jewish state by nature, by birth, by, uh, by the values, uh, by the definition, Israel is a Jewish state. Hence, Israel cares responsibility for Jewish communities all over the world. Like in Turkey, there is also a Jewish community. There is a Jewish community in France. There is a Jewish community in the UK. There is a Jewish community in the United States. Uh, so first of all, we always, as diplomats, we, <coughs> excuse me, we have a very special dialogue with this the community. Whenever we are coming to the place, we tell them that we're here also for them, though they are the, the nation, the, they are the residents and the national for Turkey and France and the UK and the US, wherever they are. But through the religion, uh, we have a special dialogue with them. And if there is a need, we have also a way to help. And we do have responsibility for those uh, communities. Uh, and that is something which is part of our principle. Um, let us move to the uh, uh, next slide. Um, the next slide actually is, uh, 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 I would like to draw the attention to uh, one or two case studies and see how all those principles that I spoke about uh, are being reflected in those case studies. So as for uh, the first case study, the Periphery Alliance, uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, but uh, a gentleman that I spoke already earlier about, uh, our first prime minister, Mr. David Ben Gurion, in 1958, uh, as part of the attempt to break Israeli isolation in the Middle East, it was very hostile at the time, much more hostile than today, he tried to build what he called the Alliance of the Periphery. He tried to build an alliance between all the non-Arab elements, Muslims, Christians, and Jews in the Middle East. And he counted four on, or three on top of Israel. So Israel is one, Turkey was the second, Iran, Iran at the time, I know it sounds crazy to me, Iran was the third one, and Ethiopia was the fourth one. So Again, the drive was to break the isolation and to bring to build alliance. Uh, two elements that I spoke about in the uh, in my uh, earlier in the earlier part of the presentation, which are part of our principles of foreign policy. And what Mr. Ben Gurion did, he sent thank you, he sent he sent a letter to uh, President Eisenhower, the American president at the time on the 24th of July, 1958, in which he uh, depicted, uh, in which he uh, explained uh, the wisdom uh, behind uh, uh, his uh, initiative to create this alliance between, again, Israel, Turkey, Iran, and Ethiopia. And he, by the way, considered Turkey to be the strongest part uh, together with Israel in this uh, alliance. Uh, and indeed, after one month, he uh, made um, uh, visit to Turkey that was not uh, published at the time, only later on. Uh, he was accompanied by uh, the foreign minister of Israel at the time and other ladies that you heard of, uh, Mrs. Golda Meir. They came with some leaders of the and the services. 
and they met your prime minister at the time, who was Mr. Adnan Menderes. Yeah. Uh, this visit uh, 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 was not uh, published at the time, only later on. Uh, Adnan Menderes, by the way, was executed after two years. I was asked by many people if there was a connection between the visit and the execution. As far no. as I know, there wasn't no, no, any no. connection. <laughs> no. to, uh, so, uh, you know, I you know, and overall, the uh, periphery alliance went down. Up some, uh, I hope you can all hear me well because I can hardly hear myself. But if you hear me, uh, that is okay. I will continue. If somebody is not on mute, um, okay, can you? I think it's unmuted again. Okay, I will continue. All right, okay. yeah. thank you. Uh, this periphery alliance actually died a natural death. Uh, in 1974, there was a coup d'etat in Ethiopia. That go down one element of the mm -hmm. alliance. I would say that the Ayla Selassie was uh, his regime was brought to an end. Uh, and uh, in 1979, there was a revolution in uh, in uh, yeah. uh, uh, Iran, and that was the end of the Soviet alliance. But I I brought it here as a case study, uh, just to show you how some of those principles are being uh, uh, reflected. Um, again, uh, we have, by the way, until our timetable is up to it's 11. Fine. It's fine. Okay. It's fine. The other case study that I will mention here only briefly, but I have a feeling we will speak about it also later on, and is, the, uh, is the energy in the East Med. I'm sure you're all following this uh, issue very closely. It's a very interesting geopolitical economic geopolitical uh, case, which is being evolved in front of our eyes. Uh, as you know, Israel have, uh, Israel have uh, uh, discovered huge uh, fields of natural gas, not far from our border. Uh, Tamar is one of them, Karish, Tanin, the biggest one, I'm sure the name is not, uh, is, the name is familiar to you, is Leviathan with 900 billion cubic meters. You know, Leviathan from some of Indeed, 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 indeed. <laughs> I, uh, I know you teach hopes uh, at the university, but uh, this Leviathan <laughs> is a great source of our uh, uh, energy, I would say, together with uh, the high tech that we all heard about. Also, those huge energy discoveries are an important part, foundation of our economy. Currently, we are using very little of this, uh, although it's a huge amount of uh, natural gas, uh, either for domestic use in Israel, uh, a little is being exported to uh, uh, Jordan, a little is being exported to uh, Egypt. But obviously, the main question is the uh, issue of exporting the, uh, this uh, uh, natural gas to the markets in Europe, which are very much interested in this uh, natural gas. Uh, the question of how to do it is still an open question. Currently, Israel, together with, with its strategic partner, uh, Greece and Cyprus, is uh, uh, developing or studying the option of marketing uh, this or uh, exporting this natural gas to uh, Europe through a pipeline that is called the Eastmed pipeline, which would stretch from Leviathan all the way through Aphrodite, collect also a Cypriot gas, go to Cyprus, to Crete, to Greece, and from there to Italy. It's a very complicated and expensive uh, initiative, but this is our number one option. There was another option, again, we'll speak about it later on if you wish, which is known as the Leviathan Mercum option, which was much easier to be implemented. But, and here I'm going to end my presentation and open it to QA. Uh, this option nowadays, I think <coughs> it is less relevant, mainly because of the intense relationship between Turkey and Israel. And I have a feeling that later on uh, the day we'll speak about those relationships uh, more than. So I would like to thank you for listening to me. I hope the volume was clear. And I have a feeling I might be uh, facing now with many, with many questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, Dr. Chair. Dear viewers, friends, it is a very interesting introduction, first of all, to Israel as a perfect concern. We recognized Israel in 1949 when Mr. Chair was present. So it is uh, one of the third uh, Muslim countries we want uh, to recognize Israel, and it became a big foreign policy uh, problem for 13 the 60s when the Arab nationalism uh, with Jamal Abdel Nasser was uh, growing up. But Turkey signed uh, Baghdad Pact in 1955 with Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, uh, Turkey, and Great uh, uh, Britain. And uh, this was uh, very interesting uh, as uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Atli said uh, there will be no uh, security alliance in the Middle East which is directed against uh, uh, Israel. And Turkey, very interesting, in the Russian members in the 50s, uh, two sides on the Israeli uh, position. Then uh, in 1956, uh, Britain and France uh, occupied, uh, or at least uh, were fighting against uh, Egypt. So the Turkish position has been very strongly criticized uh, in those years. But Turkey has done it uh, because uh, Turkey believed in that time uh, uh, that the security interests of Turkey lies to be with France and uh, Britain and together with Israel. So uh, what Mr. Ambassador was providing us is a very interesting uh, uh, framework to understand Israel uh, much better. And now we can uh, start uh, with the uh, questions. Uh, please, uh, uh, if somebody wants to ask, uh, hand, uh, increase your hand, and then we will uh, give you the word. And uh, the questions should be very precise and shortly, uh, please, so that we can have more uh, interaction. So uh, who is going to ask first? Thank you. As uh, you know, Professor uh, Bakri is a answer. Always I, I prepare myself in case there will be no questions. <laughs> I'm sure I see. No, 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 there will be. There, 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 there are questions, of course. Yes, sir. Hello, uh, <clears> Timbe. <throat> thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Microphone. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Hussein Barji and Mr. Gilad, uh, for your presentation. I prepared uh, a question for uh, for you. Uh, I sent by chat. Uh, also, if you want, I can uh, read it again. Uh, you can read I, it. That's okay. 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 Uh, the, Yes, I am. The head of uh, Foreign Policy Institute, Professor Dr. Hussein Baja, I greet you and your esteemed guest with respect. Uh, my question is: uh, Two nations have friendship, Turkish and Jewish nations, of recently at the Middle East, which adopts democratic and Western values, decrease. To level relations as diplomatic Turkey and Israel are upset, both the nation are uh, nation and are contrary to interest both sides. In my opinion, first of all, relations should be normalized first, and then brought a very good level in order to achieve this. To me, uh, Turkey and Israel can sign a C treaty for all common interest in the Mediterranean. My question is, what are the Turkey-Israel relations can brought on behalf of both countries should be good level? In this regard, I would uh, like to hear a uh, valuable op opinions of Mr. Hussein Baji and Mr. Israel Ambassador, Mr. Roy Gila. Thank you very much. Um, uh, he, uh, uh, let me repeat please, briefly please, what uh, Adam Bey said. He said that he believes, and I know both of us know Adam Bey for a long time, Adam Bey, uh, he believes that Israel and Turkey should renew 
uh, relationship that we had in the past, normal relationship, and he was asking to be work uh, to uh, open democracies in the Middle East, and he asked us to work with preventing it. He was asking you and I, let me say a few words, and then please, uh, please, I will please. be happy to compliment. Indeed, as uh, Professor Bakchi uh, 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 <coughs> mentioned, uh, Turkey was the first Muslim state to uh, acknowledge the state of Israel in 1950, to open an embassy, first at the uh, lower level, then later on in a higher level. And Turkey was facing a lot of criticism from the Arab world. How come you open an embassy uh, with Israel? Turkey said Israel is there to stay and we are, we, maybe we can influence by having relationships with Israel more than we can influence by boycotting Israel. And in that sense, Ismet Mounou, as you mentioned, Professor, I think really took the right decision. This is not the time to speak about all the relationships between 1950 and nowadays, the Baghdad Alliance and the Periphery Alliance. Again, relationship went uh, up and down for many years. In the 90s, we had what you call the strategic alliance, and then, um, uh, unfortunately, since 2010, we are having uh, kind of an ongoing uh, crisis with a small break between uh, December 16 and May 18, where we, we had an ambassador here, and you had an ambassador in Tel Aviv. <coughs> so, and we had uh, a consul general in, uh, in Istanbul, and you had the consul general in Jerusalem. Uh, again, in, since May uh, 18, this is not the situation anymore. Uh, we believe that since your government basically uh, created the last or uh, is responsible for the last uh, crisis, then uh, your government uh, knows what needs to be done in order to amend it. Uh, let me say that I share your view. I think no one relationship with two regional superpowers like uh, 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 Turkey and Israel are very important. I know there are many people in Turkey that believe the same. However, I don't think going back to the strategic relationship that we had in the 90s is something very relevant that it can continue to arise. But normal relationship in the level of ambassadors, I believe, will serve better to country to country. And the uh, uh, practice uh, history shows us that when two states have normal relationship at the level of uh, ambassador, they can iron all the differences between them. And there mm -hmm. are and there will remain differences between Israel and Turkey in a much, in a much better way. So the level of, uh, of, the, uh, of the diplomacy uh, is extremely important. Right. Um, Thank you. Yes, uh, the question and the answer was uh, very well. Uh, but uh, the issue is here how uh, from now on is also going uh, to be the relations not only between Turkey and Israel, but also between Turkey and the regional countries. And Israel and regional countries, can Israel and Turkey somehow come back uh, again? Uh, Mr. Na Ambassador Namatan will be speaking anyway between 12 and 1 o'clock this morning from Turkish perspective. But we can uh, ask uh, Mr. Shahjet uh, further. Any questions uh, more? The second question. So please, uh, uh, we're going to ask. Um, can yes. I ask a question? Aydin, I'm Aydin. Aydin, Aydin uh, please. Yeah. Aydin, uh, just uh, wait a minute. I give uh, the microphone to Mr. Ambassador. Aydin is asking to one question. Hello, and um, first of all, thank you for having you. I was wondering uh, about the about gas di diplomacy between Egypt and Israel. At the beginning of the year, you, um, I think Israel made this deal with Egypt. And before the gas deal, Egypt used to export from Al-Arish to Ashkelon, uh, gas and oil. And now it's from Ashkelon to Al-Arish. So I was wondering how this sudden change happened and what are the benefits for Israel to export now uh, oil to Al-Arish, from Ashkelon to Al-Arish? I mean, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use your question to say a word about uh, Egypt. It was basically our biggest enemy. Uh, we had a few wars with Egypt, uh, one war in 1948, uh, another one in 1950. Actually, we had also uh, an operation Stein in 1956, and we had another war in 1967. 
<clears throat> and another war in 1973. And <clears throat> <sorry>. <clears throat> there was a need for a brave uh, Egyptian leader, Anwar Sadat, to start a peace initiative with Israel in 1977 and to sign the first peace agreement that was signed between Israel and any Arab country in 1979. In that sense, I think we need to pay the respects to the late President Anwar Sadat. And indeed, uh, what we see now is a 100 degree, uh, a picture which is 100 degree uh, different than what we had until 1979. Israel and Egypt actually are nearly strategic partners. <clears throat> we have a lot of uh, dealings, a lot of dialogue, a lot of communication. And indeed, energy is an important pillar, pillar, not the only one, but an important pillar in the relationship we have currently with, with Egypt. And indeed, what you mentioned, Aileen, what is known as the East Med Gas Forum, where, uh, which is a forum, uh, economic and maybe also political forum that is trying to present the interest. We spoke about it mainly around the importance of interest, because at the end of the day, foreign relations are to serve and protect the interests of the state. So the East Med Gas Forum is there to protect and serve the interests of all the elements in the East Med, short of Turkey, which, uh, which has either uh, natural gas resources or uh, the natural gas might be uh, uh, moving through their uh, water. So we are talking about uh, Israel, we are talking about Egypt, who is actually hosting the gas forum, we are talking about Greece, we are talking about Cyprus, um, and there are even the Palestinians, so even the Palestinians are observers, um, the United States is an observer, Italy is an observer. So indeed, the East Med Gas Forum is an extremely important element in the region. Um, I, we, we again, we export like I think uh, 50 BCM, uh, between seven and a half and 15 BCM a year of natural gas to Egypt. Uh, Egyptians are using it for domestic uh, consumption, but as you all know, they have also some a huge energy um, uh, elements next to the next to the sea. So, uh, without getting into too many uh, details, uh, we might do it later on. I would say, and this is the important message I'd like to stress, Aileen, that energy can be a source of conflict, but it can and should be actually a source for partnership, I believe this is the yeah. Thank you. Uh, I thank you very much for the question and uh, also to Mr. Lepeda for the answer. Uh, the question is, uh, are there any troublemakers in the Mediterranean? The answer would be yes, but uh, maybe more. There are many troubles in the Mediterranean. <laughs> All the energy issue is uh, one of them. So. Uh, this is maybe uh, where Turkey and Israel uh, in the long run have to come together and to talk to each other uh, with the other uh, regional countries. And I think also Turkey is now uh, turning the, the direction, uh, not only to Israel, but also to Egypt. And probably uh, the Turkish position with Israel uh, would be uh, much more stronger when they come together as in the uh, good old days, <laughs> if you want. Uh, that Turkey and Israel are two uh, important economic and military powers uh, in the uh, Mediterranean. So uh, Egypt is uh, definitely a complementary country. Neither Turkey nor Israel can neglect uh, uh, Egypt. And Egyptian strategic uh, position and location is also very important for the entire Mediterranean country, uh, definitely. But uh, again, key point is here Israel and Israeli uh, position. Now we have uh, around 10 minutes, maybe we can uh, get uh, one or two uh, questions. Uh, who would be uh, willing to ask uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador? Enes? Uh, just a minute, Enes, just a minute. Okay, okay, I'm just waiting. Yes, Enes, <coughs> go ahead. So. Uh, hello, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, you talked, uh, you actually talked about Israel's foreign uh, policy balancing some uh, national interest and, uh, you know, democratic values, uh, human rights, etc. 
you know there is a special case uh, and i want to ask that uh, in like in which part of your uh, frame policy towards state of palestine do you actually balance this uh, national interest and uh, democratic values etc because you know there has been some uh, you have some, some specific frame policy towards uh, this case thank you Enes, I thank you very much for this uh, question. I actually was uh, waiting uh, for this question. Um, look, we are not uh, evasive. Uh, we do not turn the blind eye. Uh, we have uh, a dilemma. We have a conflict with the Palestinians. That has to be said. Uh, we call the Palestinians day in and day out to return to the negotiation table. Um, it's a week that the state is doing the point on the point of view with another state. Uh, we are uh, not neglecting this uh, issue, but uh, unlike what some people think, the, the, this conflict was born not in 1948 when the state was uh, born, the state of Israel. By the way, uh, that has to be said, I don't want to open it here, but in 1947, you just had the International Palestine Day on the 29th of yeah. November 1947, which is the day where the UN uh, the, uh, partition plan was uh, <coughs> was decided. And this partition plan, 181, that was voted on the 29th of November 1947, actually voted for the establishment of two states, yeah. the Jewish state and an Arab state. The Jews took it. They were not happy with the borders, but they said, okay, this is what we get, we'll build our state. The other side, unfortunately, <coughs> decided not to take it, but instead to launch a war against the young Jewish state. And actually, from there on, we have an ongoing conflict. Yet, I don't think that uh, we have to look for a historic uh, a, a, a judgment who, was, who is to be blamed. I, we are not part of this blame game, though I think our arguments are very strong. Nevertheless, we are looking for a solution, but unless the Palestinians will put their house in order and will be willing to sit with us as one people, not as uh, one government in uh, Ramallah and another one in Gaza, uh, but people that realize that there is a solution. And by the way, that's the place to say a word uh, about uh, the other government, Palestinian government, who sits in, uh, in Gaza, known as the Hamas government, that unfortunately has a warm relationship with Turkey. Uh, they, uh, and I say very clearly, that there is no room for a Jewish sovereign state in the Middle East that they consider to be a what, a, a holy Muslim what. Obviously, we have nothing to speak about with those people. Uh, we take them very seriously, and this is, this is what they say, this is what they believe. And, uh, but yet, the other government, Palestinian government in Ramallah, is a government that we can reach a dialogue and hopefully a compromise and a solution with, and this is our wish. Okay. <laughs> Dennis, uh, 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 thank you for the question, Bravo, it is a good question, uh, definitely. Uh, you see how difficult is it uh, to be uh, a small state in the, in the region where you are surrounded, uh, that you are surrounded by several counties, uh, as uh, Ambassador called unfriendly environment turns. But now all this un unfriendly environment turns to the Abraham uh, Accord in Not uh, all. We still have Syria and Lebanon, but uh, Syria, inshallah it will come as well. Uh, Syria is a, a matter not only for you, but also for us. Uh, we have 4 million uh, Syrians in Turkey, the most one in the world, by the way. Uh, it is another uh, debate, but in general, the atmosphere is much better now than uh, ever before. And uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador was trying to explain, uh, uh, Security comes first. The Pirimus uh, inter pares, among all the other factors, is the security the most important one. The security mind, uh, mind of uh, Israel is to be understood when you look to the uh, map. And this Palestinian Israeli conflict is another issue in the history since 1948. Actually, it was called before Arab Israeli conflict, not Palestinian Israeli conflict. So the other Arab countries just transfer it to Palestinian Israeli issue, although 
in all those uh, years, in the 50s, when Jamal Abdel Nasser and the others have been there, uh, we were talking uh, about the Arab Israeli conflict, all the literature, without any uh, exception, until uh, late 80s, uh, used the word Arab Israeli conflict. When uh, uh, Amr Sadat and Begin uh, signed this uh, accord, uh, Professor Nuru Yudhuse from our faculty, by the way, he published an article about this uh, accord from 19. Uh, 78, very interesting, I started to read, how uh, this uh, uh, Egyptian became suddenly enemy of the other Arab countries and Muslim brothers that you know, are responsible for the killing of uh, Anwar Sadat, uh, which is another interesting story which we will also debate in our classes. By the way, now we, we have one last question, uh, maybe. Uh, uh, who is going to ask the last question? Uh, anyone? Uh, I cannot see. Uh, could uh, somebody? Uh, no questions? I see here my good friend Ali Biriyot. Ah, Ali, Selin. maybe. Selin. Ah, okay. Selin is going to ask. Bravo, Selin. Ilyas Bey, why don't you ask here? Yeah, you are general and you should, I expect that you ask a question not from a military point of view. But Ojam, I can ask a question, no problem. <laughs> We will be no time later on. <laughs> but uh, no time anymore. You should uh, answer as soon as possible. Philip, uh, we have young generation now. <laughs> Philip, uh, you have the floor. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, well, this year was a strange year for all the people around the world. And not only the people, but the countries were also forced to be isolated physically. So uh, how was Israel's foreign policy uh, regarding the coronavirus pandemic? I would like to um, pose a question about that. Eileen, uh, thank you very much. That's a very uh, smart uh, question. Uh, just like uh, many other uh, states in the world, we had to, uh, I would say, accommodate our foreign policy uh, to be part of the national effort to fight the COVID-19. That has to be said now that the situation in Israel is not great. We had the uh, two lockdowns. We might be facing the third one. Nevertheless, there is a united effort with all the uh, government offices to try to uh, to try to uh, help uh, fighting this challenge. Uh, but uh, while we are concentrating mainly in the domestic effort, Berlin. This doesn't mean that we have dropped the international effort. As we speak now, there is a, a vaccine which is being developed in Israel as well, mm. um, um, uh, together with the Pfizer and Moderna and the uh, Russian uh, vaccination and the Chinese vaccination. So also the Israeli Biological Institute, as we speak now, Palin is heavily invested in uh, developing its own vaccination. Uh, last week, we just had a delegation that went to Italy uh, to help in fighting the, uh, the corona. Uh, Israel, as I said, I, I spoke before about our aid known as Mashab, the international uh, agency for uh, international, uh, the international agency for cooperation uh, has contributed to this effort. Uh, I know also Turkey, that has to be, uh, we have to give a compliment to Turkey was very much uh, into this business of what is known as a, a COVID-19 diplomacy or anti-COVID-19 diplomacy. Uh, again, uh, the gentleman, Enes, you asked me before about the, the Palestinians. So we did try as much as we can to help both, by the way, the people in the West Bank and the people in Gaza. That has to be said, as much as we have a problem with the Hamas uh, administration in Gaza, we just uh, ignored it and we tried to help as much as we can the two million Palestinians who live in Gaza. So just like any other states in the world, we did not uh, neglect, we did not turn a blind eye from the pandemic that took all of us by a huge surprise around March. And let me just hope that uh, at the beginning of 2021, we should see an end to this nightmare in Israel, in Turkey, and all over the world. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> so, uh, 
Uh, now, uh, I thank very much uh, to Mr. Ambassador for his uh, comprehensive uh, explanation as well as uh, sincere uh, answers to the questions uh, coming from the young audience. I thank all uh, to those who put the questions. And now uh, we move uh, to another uh, subject, uh, Professor Ilya Reichert uh, from uh, Viscount University. And I'm uh, proudly uh, here to declare that he's also one of our former students. Uh, we are very uh, proud that he became a uh, professor and teaching uh, at the university about Israel. He will be one of the best uh, Israel uh, knowledgeable uh, academics here in Turkey. So uh, he has been also in uh, Israel uh, at the university in Tel Aviv, and uh, he knows uh, the domestic uh, factors uh, over there. And he will try uh, to provide us uh, uh, from the uh, Israeli, uh, from the Israeli political point uh, of view, uh, how as an, uh, an academic sees uh, the uh, Israeli uh, domestic factors uh, which shape the foreign policy of uh, Israel. And uh, now, uh, uh, Ilka is just next to me, and I would like to give the floor to him. And uh, I wish you a very uh, fruitful uh, discussion with him. We will have again uh, the speech, and then uh, we have a uh, question and uh, answer period, and Ilka will manage it alone uh, to get the questions and uh, answer. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, welcome uh, to our uh, conference, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to your uh, talk. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, thank you very much uh, to the uh, foreign service for inviting me today. Uh, to be part of the State of Distinguished Panel, which uh, is very much as a fair, and uh, later on with former uh, British Ambassador to, to Israel, uh, Ambassador Naomi Trump. Uh, this is a great opportunity to, to get to you and to, to talk about my views. Of course, I have the great misfortune of speaking after uh, the Shaja of Affair, which, which is great and very interesting uh, talk, full of uh, policy oriented matters. I might uh, being a lecturer myself, I might uh, sound awfully didactic uh, to you, but I can't help that, unfortunately. Uh, let me begin by saying a few words about a completely unrelated matter, which is very close to my heart, though. Uh, Professor, uh, nothing can be heard. Can you hear me? Uh, we must, uh, it's not clear. The quality is very low. Right? If you can give me two Yes, John, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? It's better now. Yes, it's better now. Maybe I should. All right. Uh, uh, I decided to talk about the domestic sources of Israeli foreign policy. Uh, ultimately, yes, foreign policy is made by foreign policy experts, but there are always these, these domestic which would bear upon uh, 
the making of, of that policy. Basic search uh, guidelines, principles are set by the domestic environment, usually by what we call still scientists call independent variables, right? They exist independently of the foreign policy makers, but the foreign policy makers have to take those into consideration. Now, uh, first of all, let me start by asking a simple question. What brings us together here? And why are we talking about this work? Why not Brazil? Why not, I don't know, Mongolia? Uh, countries that are in terms of territory much bigger or in terms of population much larger, uh, but, but Israel. After all, Israel is historically a very new country. It was established in 1948. Uh, in terms of its territory within the Green Line, uh, its territory is, is, is slightly about 20,000 square kilometers. Uh, just to give the, the Turkish audience a comparison, and I a point of departure, Israel is half the size of Konya, right? Uh, uh, in that respect, quite a tiny country. Its population, the last time I checked was last summer, and Israeli population is slightly, only slightly about 9 million people. If we do a ranked order of countries according to their territorial size, according to their land area, Israel is placed between El Salvador and Slovenia. El Salvador being slightly larger and Slovenia being slightly smaller. Now, with all due respect to both countries, El Salvador and, and Slovenia, and I trust that there is no one in the audience from those two countries. When was the last time you heard about those countries in international politics? Even if you do that, that's quite rare. So clearly, there is something interesting about Israel, right? We, we constantly hear about Israel on the news, usually with unpleasant news, right, regarding the, the conflict. Uh, but Israel seems to produce an annual quota of headlines for the international community. Uh, just to speak about a few uh, striking features, what makes Israel so interesting and so worth paying attention to is, well, first of all, the founders of Israel, the Jews, are also founders and bearers of an Abrahamic religion, which makes them quite a special people. Historically and anthropologically speaking, uh, Jews have been the Jewish other of Christian Europe, right? So they are part and parcel of the European and Western history. They are very much part of the historical fabric of that continent. And not just the continent, right, of all Western people. Uh, in, in 1948, I have already said that Israel was established after a war in two stages, right? Israelis would call this their war of independence. Palestinians would call it the Nakba, the great disaster. Uh, in the first stage, Israelis defeated uh, the Palestinian irregulars. In the second stage, they defeated a combination of Arab armies that surrounded them. And later on, in, in, in further wars, Israel created an image of invincibility, right? An aura of invincibility. Immediately after its foundation, it became a party to the Cold War. Uh, and after 1967, I would say, Israel was firmly recognized as a strategic ally of the United States of America. In uh, the late 1960s, Israel joined the nuclear club, being the, the fifth country to do so, right? joining the, the club of four, bringing the number to five. Uh, and since then, uh, since its foundation in 1948, Israel has made great socioeconomic strides forward. Uh, currently, according to the UN Human Development Index, Israel is ranking 22nd, which places Israel about countries like Italy, Spain, and France which is, I would say, no mean achievement, right? Quite an achievement, actually. Oh, okay. Now, in terms of uh, Israeli foreign policy, what are its origins? Where did it come from? Now, uh, yes, Israel is a new country established in 48, but Israeli foreign policy was not born over, overnight in 1948. I would say that there was almost a 70-year preparation before uh, the Israeli state was finally established and its foreign policy was fixed with certain uh, almost unchanging principles. Uh, I'm talking about almost 70 years of Zionist uh, institutionalization, both in the diaspora and also in the Ottoman and mandatory Palestine. Uh, well, for many of you, Zionism might, 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 might ring the wrong bell. You might think that it's, it's an evil force in the Middle East. Simply put, Zionism is Jewish nationalism, 
it's a form of Jewish nationalism because there were other types of Jewish nationalism in the past. Uh, all of these Jewish nationalisms were rooted in the idea that diaspora, especially in the 19th century, was dangerous for the Jews. Anti-Semitism was born and was on the rise. Jews were not feeling safe. Uh, and the only solution to many people at the time seemed that Jews should have a state of their own as well. Uh, but where that state should be, there were various proposals. The Zionist proposal was to go back to the original, the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people. Various institutions was created for this. Uh, one important one was Vaad Leumi, uh, the Jewish National Council in, in, in mandatory Palestine. The other one was the Jewish Agency in the diaspora. What's important for the sake of my talk is that both these institutions, one in diaspora, one in Israel, sorry, in mandatory Palestine, they had specific departments dealing with foreign policy. Right? That's what I was referring to as 70 years of preparation. And in 1948, these two departments simply merged to create Misradakut, the Israeli Foreign Ministry. This was how Jews were returning back to the diplomatic map, uh, from which they were absent for almost, I believe, uh, 18th century. Right? Right? Jews did not have self-government for a very, very, very long time. Uh, two very important debates among Israeli foreign policy makers began uh, as early as the 1950s and 60s. Uh, those two debates, I think, are still not resolved. They are still part of the foreign policy making in Israel. Uh, they're very much visible, I would say. They color the tone of policy. The first debate I'm going to refer to is what I call uh, the debate between idealists and the realists. The idealist position was, was mainly represented by Israel's uh, founding front, uh, foreign minister and late on prime minister, Moshe Sharet. Uh, Sharet's position was that in the 1950s, right, I'm referring to 1950s right now, he thought that Israel was very strong at that point, military speaking, but strength, uh, if it's solely based on the military, it cannot be sustained forever. Therefore, he thought that Israel must, as quickly as possible, integrate it. Uh, it should join into the local terrain, the local terrain being the Muslim Arab Middle East. Uh, Israelis, the Jewish Israelis, should give up as much as possible, to the extent possible, their European, their diaspora mentality, and uh, should start to think like Levantines, like people of the area. He thought only this, right, integration, could guarantee long-term survival for Israel. And for that purpose, he argued, uh, Israel should be ready to make some concessions, right? some concessions. Those could be territorial concessions. More importantly, he even uh, kind of circulated the idea that a total number of Palestinian refugees could be returned back to become Israeli citizens. To a certain extent, I, I don't think it has ever become official policy, but that was circulated as an idea. Uh, so this is one side of the debate. On the other side, you have the realists. Of course, uh, the chief personality among the realists was the founding prime minister, Ben Gurion. He was supported by some party bosses within the Labour Party, at the time, but most importantly, by a new generation of young officers, those being Moshe Dayan, Ariel Sharon, and several others, who supported his vision. According to this vision, according to the realist vision, Arabs were not ready to make peace with Israel. Arabs thought that Israel was just another crusader. Remember, crusaders who arrived in the Middle East very early on in the 11th century. They stayed on for about 200 years. Uh, and uh, afterwards, they, they just disappeared. So the Arabs, right, according to the realist view, Arabs assume that the same thing would happen with the Jews, right? For some time, as long as they are militarily powerful, uh, they would dominate the region, but ultimately the numbers would win, right? Uh, the Arab majority and Arab history would, would win out. And therefore, uh, the, the realist Ben Gurion assumed that peace with the Arabs was far, far away. Uh, 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 several generations would need to pass until Arabs could reconcile themselves with this reality. And therefore, until then, until Arabs would reach that kind of a position of concession, Israel must hold fast. It should consolidate its military superiority. It should continue to defeat 
and that will continue to deter aggression against it. The gist of the idea in the realist position is that peace is not worth, is not so much worth, is not necessarily worth making concessions to. Like concessions should wait, uh, hopefully never to be made. Now, these two visions uh, of, 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 of Israeli foreign policy, they collided on the way to the Suez War. Eventually, the realists won, and uh, Moshe Sharet uh, had to give up prime ministry. He was replaced by Prime Minister Ben Gurion again, uh, leading to the victory of the realist vision. I think both visions are still with us today in the Israeli foreign policy, uh, with varying degrees of success. The second debate is, uh, is again a question. Uh, uh, Okay, Radia Gizam Shenov is suggesting that all of you should turn off your microphones. I don't know why, but I mean, for me, there's no problem. Now, the second debate is about the question of uh, this might seem like a very superfluous question to you. Uh, where is Israel? Or where should Israel be located? Where should Israel's borders be? Uh, this is not a superfluous question, as I said, because ultimately this reflects a debate on Israel's borders. On the one side of the fault line, again, you have the Israeli right wing, the right wingers. Uh, this includes the Likud, this includes the Russian immigrants, many of them being Jewish, some of them non Jewish, but Israeli citizens, nevertheless, the religious parties. And of course, uh, hundreds of thousands of settlers who continue to settle, to live in settlements in, in, in the West Bank. Uh, the, the latest figure I got was the six, approximately 600,000. Now, according to the right wingers in Israel, Israel cannot be reduced to within the green line. Right? Those, those borders should be kept, but Israel has to slightly expand beyond the green line. It must keep the West Bank, what the international community refers to as the West Bank, or what the right wingers refer to, refer to as as, as uh, Judea and Samaria, Yehuda uh, Veshumbor. This is indeed the region where the Jews have the deepest historical ties to. If you read the Hebrew Bible, for example, you will find out that uh, almost everything of importance in the Hebrew Bible happens within those territories, within what is today West Bank. Therefore. Uh, they would want to hold on to those territories. They believe that this should be part of the Jewish heritage. It should eventually become part of Israel as well. Well, of course, the question of what's going to happen to Palestinians with Israel is, is either constantly postponed uh, and there's hardly a, a tangible solution for that in the Israeli foreign policy, I would say. The opposing group, on the other hand, is historically the Israeli left and the labor. These are the people who believe that Israel is where the Jews are a majority, okay, and where they are safe and secure. <laughs> Expansionism beyond the green line, according to this view, the left wing view, will only bring conflict and it will further isolate Israel in the international community. That will create another unsafe environment for the Jewish people. Therefore, therefore, the left wing view historically had considered the territories, West Bank, Gaza, uh, and to a certain extent, the Golan Heights, as bargaining chips in future peace talks. Uh, so according to this view, con concessions could be made, and they should be made, if they're going to bring peace, security, and legitimacy to uh, Israelis. Now, let me draw your attention one more time to this very important question. The border question is not just a military question. It's not just a foreign policy question. It's ultimately a question about the identity of Jewish Israelis. Like who is a Jew and what is this person's identity? It is going to be a, a very crucial part of the future debates on Israel's borders. Uh, in my remaining time, which is not much, uh, let me say finally a few words about three structural parameters of Israeli foreign policy. What I mean by structural parameters is are, are these independent variables. These are fete compli, these are facts on the ground which determine, which have a great impact on foreign policy making. I'm going to refer to three of those. Uh, 
uh, one could uh, actually. Is it possible to uh, for the moderator to mute uh, to mute all the participants because they people are calling for that? I don't know how to do this. Oh, there's a mute here. Uh, I'm going to refer to three such uh, structural parameters. Those are going to be first territory or the shape of Israel's land area. The second one is going to be Israel's geostrategic location and regional balance of power that is dictated by this location. And finally, demography. Uh, let me begin with the shape of Israel, which the ambassador, sorry, the charge of the we already had referred to. Israel's current shape in its recognized borders within the Green Line presents Israel with a lot of complications, like complications for Israel's security. From the north to south, Israel is approximately 430 kilometers long and in a rectangular shape. But in the middle of this big rectangle, from Haifa in the north to south of Tel Aviv in the south, there is this 100 kilometer long narrow strip of land, which we refer to as Israel's narrow wasteland. Right? It's, it's Israel's narrow wastes. Now, this is a very uh, important narrow waste in the sense that more than half of Israeli population lives exactly there. Uh, Israel's most of industrial base is located here. All foreign investment coming to Israel is poured particularly into this region. All of Israel's electricity and water lines pass through this area. The Trans-Israel Highway, of course, passes through this area. Israel's only international airport is located here as well. If, if you have noticed, I'm talking about primary targets in, in case of an attack from abroad. That's a conventional attack. Uh, also, this rectangle, uh, sorry, this, this, this narrow waste is indeed very narrow. In Haifa, for example, uh, Haifa is only 35 kilometers away uh, from the border with West Bank. Uh, Tel Aviv, only 20 kilometers. Ben Gurion Airport, only 9 kilometers. Right? So, complications you can imagine. This is what Israelis always refer to as the lack of their strategic depth. And that's why they believe that they cannot absorb the supplies of that. Now, this means that Israel, in terms of determining its foreign policy as well as security policy, they invest very heavily in their power of deterrence. Right? Deterrence is basically, right, as it is defined in international policy, I'll hurt you more if you attack me. So don't do that. Right? It's, it's, it's a way of deterring other people. This means that Israel, has a very strong knee-jerk reaction when it's uh, challenged at its home base, right? Uh, they have a very strong preemptive uh, instinct. Now, why is this very important to know? It's very important to know, for example, if you decide to send a flotilla of ships uh, to, to question Israel's authority over Gaza Strip, you should expect certain results, right? That's what exactly happened in Mavi Marmara. Uh, almost 10 years ago. So territory and shape dictate a lot in, in terms of Israel's foreign policy. Next, uh, Israel's geostrategic location and regional balance of power. Israel is located in a geographical area which we call the South Levant, right? And this place has historically been a crossing point for all the invading armies. In modern times, these could be external powers like Napoleonic France, uh, the British Army, or almost the Nazis were about to enter the area as well as they, they had won in North Africa. But normally, normally, uh, the, the South Levant is a crossing point for three political hinterlands which uh, surround the South Levant. You may call these hinterlands or basins. These are basically three. Uh, one is Egypt. The other one is Anatolia, and the other one is a combination of Mesopotamia and Iran, right? These are three basins which can sustain very large populations 
and they are state uh, 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 producing regions. Major states emerge in these areas. People come and go. The ethnic identities might change, but nevertheless, big states emerge from these three bases. Uh, and whenever one of them feels strong enough, it aims to conquer the other. That has been the historical record. This is either from south or north, right? The Egyptians trying to conquer the Hittites, or this is from north to south, which is more common. Various armies, starting from the Assyrians, the Hellenistic kingdoms, the Romans, the Arab armies, the Ottomans, the Byzantium, right? Too many armies have passed through the South Levant region because this is the only opening uh, that is available for the army into Middle East. Why is this important? This is important because an independent state in the South Levant. Oh, sorry. Uh, Okay, uh, uh, because an independent state in the South Levant is an exception, right? It's a historical exception. It's rarely occurred. The only instance which I have seen before is uh, it dates back to 9th century or 10th century BC, that's the Davidic kingdom. The next time this occurred is, is the current situation where we have Israel, right? Remind me if anyone in the audience that there had ever been a, an independent state in, in the area. So I think there are enormous lessons to be driven from an Israeli perspective, from the geostrategic location. Israel can maintain its, uh, its, 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 its independence in the long run as long as there's a balance of power between these three basins in the area. Uh, and this is what Israel, I think, is very much committed to. That not one of these states would dominate the region. That's why Israel is very careful about nuclearization, right? I think the attacks against uh, the Iraqi capacity or the or a possible attack in the future about the Iranian capacity can be explained in such terms. Uh, therefore, this, this I think just strategic location must be taken very, very, very seriously. Finally, uh, and I'm at the end of my work. Beni doğrudan şey bıraksın sen. Ver vere. Siz oradan geçin. Zaten bir saat yaklaşık 45 dakika bir saat sonra. Halleder misiniz o? Halleder. Zaten başı kimin var? Girecek. Well, what's wrong with me? Let's even go earlier. Before the Second World War. Ben de onu aradan çıkarmış olayım. Hocam, iPhone kullanıcısı lütfen mikrofonunuzu kapar mısınız? Uh, the Nazis murdered approximately 5.5 to 6 million in Europe. Uh, so the number was down to 11 to 12 point, sorry, 12 million Jews at the time when Israel uh, was established in 1948. And less than 1 million of them lived in Israel at the time of its establishment. Now this created a huge imbalance between what I call the diaspora and Israel. Uh, could Israel speak in the name of all the Jews, or was it just a state of its own people? And uh, Mr. Ginat has already argued that Israel actually represents the Jews, but at the beginning, this was very unclear. And uh, yes, the European Jewry was devastated. They were no longer an important force in European politics. In, in the Middle East, the Arabic-speaking Jews, the Mizrahi Jews were, were not very powerful either. But in North America, particularly in the United States, even at the time there was more than 4 million Jews, there was an affluent community, a very important community. The Jews of North Africa did not like to be called exiles. And in a very important document in, uh, I believe, in the first half of the 1950s, there was quite a quarrel between Israel, the Prime Minister Ben Gurion, and the leadership of the American Jewish community at the time, the leader of the uh, uh, the conference of the American uh, uh, president of Jewish organizations. It has a very clumsy and long name, uh, Mr. Jacob Lasky, right? Jacob Lasky basically dictated policy to Israel at the time that Ben Gurion should not refer to, to American Jews as exile. And America is not exile. Uh, now things are changing. Uh, currently, Israel has taken over the United States as the most populous Jewish community in the world. And the next 10 to 15 years, it's expected that Israel will have more than half of the global number of Jews. 
Now that will create a new momentum. And this is being, I think, taken very seriously in terms of foreign policy making in Israel. I've spoken for exactly 30 minutes. I'll, I'll stop. Here. So, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Reiser. Now we can uh, start with the uh, question and uh, answer. If there are any. Yes, there, there will be, uh, definitely, because what you uh, explained here. Many, many things are very new uh, for those people who do not know Israel, including myself. I mean, I, I learned also a lot from the geography to the demography. And also, uh, uh, what the uh, Israeli uh, people experienced, or the Jewish people experienced uh, during the uh, Holocaust. And uh, also, the interesting point was, of course, what you said uh, does the uh, state of Israel represent all the Jews? This is a very interesting uh, discussion. Maybe you could uh, elaborate a little bit more. Uh, I asked you for a question. <laughs> this is okay, now you uh, want me to respond. <laughs> uh, about the diaspora, uh, uh, this uh, Israeli lobby in the uh, American uh, Congress and uh, Senate uh, in particular, then uh, uh, you know, much better than I do, than Stephen uh, Gold and uh, uh, John Mersheimer, they wrote this book uh, about the uh, Israeli lobby. Could you a little bit uh, elaborate? One, the lobby. The second, uh, what is the role of them now in America and how the Turkish uh, Israeli relations suffer or uh, will be improved in future concerning uh, the uh, lobby uh, of uh, Israelis in America? Uh, okay, let me start with, uh, with the lobby question. <laughs> uh, yes, this is uh, uh, a question that I always get in classes. Uh, uh, there's no doubt that American politics is basically lobby politics. The, the Jewish lobby is not the only lobby. There are numerous lobbies in Washington, D.C., and they are all trying to affect, to change the course of American uh, foreign policy or domestic policy uh, in favorable terms. And to a certain extent, uh, they are successful, to other extent, they're not. But we're all part of democratic politics. I think it would be very wrong uh, to believe in this mythical proportions of the Jewish lobby in, in Washington. There is a strong lobby, no doubt. Uh, but let's remember that American foreign policy is determined by American foreign policy makers, and ultimately, it serves American national interests. Uh, yes, American foreign policy makers are, I believe, ready to make concessions for Israel, as long as Israeli and American interests would overlap. If they don't, I don't think uh, Americans would band over backwards to placate Israel. Uh, and the power of the Jewish lobby in, in Israel is not necessarily based on, on pulling economic strings. That's another assumption, a wrong assumption, I would say, uh, throughout the world. This is also a, num a question of numbers, right? Uh, American Jews, until recently, uh, were uh, commanding great numbers in American politics. They were located in these uh, strategic swing states, places like New York, places like California, especially Florida. And therefore, uh, presidential candidates had to really invest in the lobby. They had to please the lobby to a certain extent. However, there are really interesting changes taking place in American politics as well, because uh, uh, the uh, uh, the number of American Jews is not on the rise. It's actually declining as a result of uh, uh, marriages, uh, interfaith marriages. People are no longer necessarily identifying themselves. Number of membership in the, uh, or Jewish organizations is also on the decline. And therefore, uh, I think uh, that the, the, the Jewish lobby is increasingly being taken over by other lobbies, like the Latino lobby. Because now they are commanding even greater numbers. Now, so much for the lobby question. Uh, uh, back to whether Israel represents uh, the Jews. Well, from my perspective, uh, that creates further complications. I understand that Israel is a Jewish state, the Medina Yehudis, right? It, it, it is defined in its Declaration of Independence as a Jewish state. It's a very noble place, right? Ultimately, Israel is a sanctuary for all the Jews around the world who suffer injustice and they do suffer in They should have a place to go back to. 
but the moment is well speak in the name of the Jew of those other things, or it seems too protected. Uh, uh, I think that uh, that's problematic for those non-Israeli Jews themselves, because it creates problems, uh, fringe elements in the whole society. I think about Turkey, for example. Uh, I remember very well after the bombing of the synagogue in, in, in the early 2000s, uh, the Israeli foreign minister at the time, Sylvain Shalom, immediately visited Turkey and went to the site. And I remember reading uh, my other specialty, by the way, is Turkish far right. I'm very much interested in Turkish far right. Uh, I, 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 I follow their newspapers, their websites. I remember there was a flood of, of questions. Why is the Israeli uh, foreign minister here. These are Turkish Jews, they're Turkish citizens. So it creates problems of double loyalty in the eyes of fringe elements in the host society. These could be fringe right, right? And it could also be fringe left. So I think Israel should must, well, maybe they're already doing that, but I don't know this. They need to fine tune their interest in these non Israeli Jewish communities mm -hmm. who are not part of Israel. Thank you. Uh, now we have Shamil Shamil uh, who wants to ask one question. Shamil, you are on the line. Thank you, Hocam. Ilker Hocam, thank you. Uh, it could be a more specific question. No. Can you hear me? Now, can you hear me, Hocam? I can hear you, Hocam. Hocam sesiniz çok. Siz beni duyuyor musunuz? Hey, you can ask right now. Okay. Okay, is it for me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ilker Hocam. It could be more specific question, but I'm wondering, uh, are the remittances playing role for the Israel's economy? If they play, to what extent? You mean what? Remittances? Remittances, yeah. Play, playing role for the Israel's economy. What remittances are you referring to? Are you talking about the German reparations agreement? No, no, no. Remittances. The the money uh, came from abroad to the ah, okay. home country. All right. Now, if you can hear me, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you, Jam. Is it clear? All right. Uh, for many years, particularly the early years of Israeli status, uh, those what you call remittances. These could be either investments or, or low interest help. Uh, sometimes just donations, the sale of Israeli bonds. Uh, these were of great help to the state of Israel. Currently, Israel is economically strong enough not to ask for such help. On the contrary, Israelis are asking the diaspora community to invest whatever sources they, they can pool to invest those uh, donations in the host country, to keep the Jewish faith and Jewish identity alive. Right, uh, so that numbers do not decline, so that intermarriages would not mean loss of uh, Jewish people. Uh, now they are very much interested in strengthening the diaspora community. So they're not soliciting help. If such help comes anyway, of course they're not going to reject it. But I'm I'm, I'm trying to say that it's not a major item uh, on on the Israeli budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we have. Um... Would we uh, ask them who is going to ask now? No? Yeah. And so the, uh, the next one, please. 
So the next question, please. Hocam ben sorabilirim. No. Hocam ben sorabilirim. So the next question, please. Maybe there's no name. Are there not any questions? Oh, there's one. Alina is uh, Alina? Alina is the question. Alina, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, first of all, thank you for the speech. And uh, I was wondering uh, how the assassination of the uh, Iran's nuclear uh, scientists currently as uh, Iran's officials indicated by Israel will affect the future relations of Iran and Israel. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't think I should be responding to that question. Uh, you should ask Iranians, and of course, the, the, the charge of the affair of Israel who is right here with me. Maybe you would like to respond. Uh, the, the only response I can say is that that seems like very much part of that knee-jerk reaction I have been referring to. Right, the balance of power in terms of uh, having a, not having a nuclear right here to prevent uh, the establishment of, uh, of nuclear power in, in the Middle East. That, that could be the only response. Uh -huh. So uh, maybe in this respect, I can uh, jump in it. So this will be uh, one of the Did most interesting uh, developments. ליד הים שם, אתה יודע. ליד שם, ליד בית הכנסת. אוקיי, קראו לבוספורוס, כן. ליד המסגד. Uh, people in the Middle East uh, would lose their lives. So it is much more uh, dangerous. But he was uh, using this rhetoric, uh, of course, and uh, many countries uh, would like to have nuclear weapons, including uh, uh, Turkey. Turkey is also, uh, as uh, President uh, Erdogan said last year, 4th of uh, September in Siva, he said, if uh, the others have nuclear weapons, why not Turkey? So it is an open a uh, discussion whether Turkey will have also a nuclear uh, program. The Iranians claim that uh, it is uh, a friendly uh, nuclear program, and uh, the discussions now, uh, after uh, Trump uh, left office, oh, yeah, no, so no, yeah. officially on the strength of okay. the case, uh, and we can uh, come here. Yeah. We America can walk from here. From okay. This, uh, treaty in 2018. Now, Biden and Germany Angela Merkel now will start a new debate, a new talk uh, with uh, Iran uh, concerning the nuclear uh, program. This is a very interesting uh, development uh, to get Iran back uh, to the uh, track and uh, also America probably will sign uh, the uh, nuclear treaty, five plus one as it, it is uh, called. What, but what is more important here is the killing of uh, the scientists and the uh, the killing of Qasem Soleimani uh, uh, before. Uh, they are a type of uh, events which uh, will put uh, new debate uh, in the uh, Middle East. But again, uh, this cafe is not the right uh, no. person to ask this. Maybe uh, later on, uh, when Ambassador Namak Khan will speak, he can uh, have also his view about this. But it is the problem of uh, Israel and the Iran. Uh, and I think uh, the Israelis and the uh, Iranians should answer that. Yeah. Okay, the next one. Uh, any questions? Uh, one, uh, can I see? Uh, yes, Tayanj. Hojam, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, uh, my question is about the Israelis, the Arab citizens. Uh, when we look at the, the last year's election, uh, we saw a dramatic decrease the voter participation from 64% uh, to the 50%. And and after the election, when we look at the Netanyahu's uh, government as coalition, we saw many uh, right wing uh, parties and the religious Jewish parties. So uh, what is your thoughts about that? Uh, is there any... Uh, let's say uh, discrimination for the, the Arab uh, nationals within the Arab citizens within the Israel 
or uh, Netanyahu are specifically forwarded that policy, or uh, just be, or uh, there's another factor that uh, that leads to this kind of decrease the voter participation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's a good question. It's a very multifaceted question. Uh, and as a political historian, let me give you a historical uh, response to that. Uh, when Israel was founded, uh, it counts within its borders a large minority of Arabs because many Palestinians had left or they were forced out as in an act of ethnic cleansing. There are still debates within Israel whether they left on their own or whether they, they, were, they, they, they were ethnically cleansed. Israeli historians are also debating about this. Uh, but in any case, there was a sizable minority of Palestinians. And during the first uh, two decades of status, these people were largely silent. First of all, there was military government placed upon them, which restricted all of their actions. And at the same time, uh, their cause, the Palestinian cause, was basically appropriated by the Arab, other Arab states, mainly Egyptian, Egypt. Right? Egypt spoke in the name of the Palestinians. Uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, if I'm not wrong, I mean, I'm not an expert on Palestinian affairs, but it was, it was uh, founded earlier, uh, but it was a plating of the Egyptians for, for some years. Okay, uh, for three years. But after 1967, it's a wholly different story. That's the beginning of the emancipation of the Arabs. In terms of emancipation, both internally, from the military administration in Israel and also emancipation from Egypt. Uh, uh, they started to have to develop their own institutions. They took over the Palestinian Liberation Organization from what was his name, Ahmed Kukeri or something like that, uh, uh, a political tool of Egyptians. And that's the beginning of Yasser Arafat as a spokesperson for the Palestinians. Um, in, in general, since 1967, the, the Palestinian Arab community in Israel is a very vocal community. On paper, according to law, they have political and legal equality. However, in practice and in certain other fields, they face discrimination. Uh, for example, much of the land, not much, but a large amount of land in Israel belongs to uh, the Jewish National Fund, which can only be lent to Jews. Uh, so if you're a uh, uh, Palestinian citizen of Israel, you would not have access to those lands. I'm talking about discrimination of this sort. In the 1990s, especially during the peace process, there was a greater effort to integrate the Palestinians. For the first time, Palestinians began to enter the cabinet as, as, as uh, uh, deputy ministers. Some uh, Palestinian Arabs or the Druze uh, members of the Jewish community were appointed as diplomats, sometimes as ambassadors. Uh, so they are becoming increasingly visible, not only in the private sector, but also in the public sphere. I would say the Palestinian Arab community is, is integrated into Israel's welfare system. Uh, in terms of their socioeconomic level and educational level, they are uh, better off than Arabs living around Israel. However, of course, they do have very strong national aspirations. And their numbers are on the right. Uh, and they are enjoying the political power right now. That, that is clear, as in the question you have asked, that it's clear in the increasing turns. Uh, right? they, they are more and more turning out at the ballot box, joining the elections, and supporting Arab parties. Historically speaking, they were voting for uh, the parties in the Israeli system, Jewish parties, those would be Likud or Labour. Uh, uh, but there's an increasing, I believe, tendency to go for other part. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, sir, sir. Uh, I thought the latest publication by uh, Amin Malou, uh, the decline of the uh, uh, culture for civilizations, uh, in Turkey, sure, uh, in Turkey. Uh, it is a very interesting publication to look. Uh, uh, to the Middle East from an Arab perspective, and he considers, for example, that was the biggest mistake of uh, uh, Lebanese government to accept that the Palestinian Liberation Organization had its headquarters in uh, Beirut, but not uh, in uh, uh, Jordanian, for example. Jordan has more than 2.5 million uh, Palestinians, the biggest uh, Palestinian state, uh, if you want to use this. Very interesting. Uh, for the students who have interest, uh, uh, how to uh, Arab eye look uh, to this even Israeli 
Palestinian uh, conflict, uh, definitely uh, it would be very interesting. Two questions, maybe one, uh, Yamur Bikenar was, uh, I think, uh, asking one question, and then Evren Gönen. Uh, Yamur, are you going to ask uh, the question? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, please go on. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, I, first of all, thank you. And I was also going to ask about the water water problem with regards to the West Bank area and Gaza, since the majority of the area, uh, although the participation within the water distribution is, as far as I as far as I researched is distributed within both Israeli and Palestinian National Authority's uh, parts. Yet, since there are some records that Israeli government is prohibiting the formation of some wells, at, at, especially in the West Bank area, and they are uh, claiming that some ac academicians are claiming that uh, Israeli uh, dominance is very prevalent in these uh, institutions as well. So I was very going to ask you your comment. Yeah, no, very good. Uh, very good, Yamur. Yeah, congratulations. Very good question. Water is the biggest <laughs> problem, uh, definitely. And uh, I'm also looking forward to the answer. And we get all the questions from Evan and uh, we. Uh, I can't okay. forget. Let okay. me just respond. Okay. Yamur, yeah, can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Yes, sir, John. Uh, because you have done fresh research, you're probably much more knowledgeable about it <laughs> than I am. But let me tell you yes, Israel is a, pool, is a water pool country. It's, it's, it's desperately reliant on, on, on water projects. And the most important water aquifer in, in the entire region is located under what we call the West Bank, right? It's a mountainous area, it receives rain. And that water is currently being used by Israel, right? Israel is tapping into this water resource. And they're trying to prevent the local population for drilling uh, wells so that this water resource is not dispersed. That's true. And in the future, that's going to be one of the reasons why Israel will try to hold on to large parts of the West Bank. Right? Water is definitely an issue here. Um, Yamur, uh, Turkey and Israel uh, had also uh, water uh, debates, water discussions in the 90s, uh, in particular uh, with this uh, peace pipeline uh, project, in particular. And there were a lot of uh, uh, discussions how to. Uh, do this water pipeline, what Turkey has now with uh, Northern Cyprus, no? Turkey, uh, the pipeline, uh, the water from uh, Antalya transferred to uh, Cyprus, Northern Cyprus, and it is a big uh, help. Uh, I visited uh, this uh, uh, dam in uh, uh, North uh, Cyprus, and the, uh, the uh, price uh, uh, discussion between Turkey and Israel, I think it was a big uh, problem. But uh, definitely, uh, water is the problem in the Middle East. And we had uh, early early 90s in the international uh, literature uh, debates like this, the future of water wars, uh, the future, the water wars will shape uh, the region. And Turkey is uh, one of the countries not uh, providing enough water to Syria, for example. It was another issue uh, in the 90s. But you touched really uh, uh, upon a very interesting uh, issue, Yamur. Uh, your name is also water, <laughs> Yamur, <laughs> dealing with water. Uh, I think <laughs> you should write your master thesis about this. Uh, as we say, don't uh, don't count the uh, uh, drops of the water of the water uh, of the rain. Important point is that it rains. But in this part of the world, there are uh, not so much rain and every drop of water plays an important role. And now the last question, uh, Evan, Gönen. Um, Mr. Aytur, thank you, first of all, for your presentation and valuable uh, opinions. Uh, I would like to know that uh, how the Knesset uh, Israel Parliament is shaping the future of West Bank uh, instead of the uh, foreign policy makers. And I would like to know that uh, the domestic pol the differences between domestic politics and foreign policy. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, I could I could hardly hear you, Evan. But if I yes, heard you right, you are asking a question about the Knesset's role in the making of foreign policy in Israel, right? Yeah, uh, it's it's that uh, how the Knesset shaping the foreign policy of the of the state of Israel. 
Okay, I mean, could you hear me? Don't repeat it. Repeat it again. Repeat it again, Evran. Can you hear me now? Yes. Repeat the question. Uh, how the Knesset uh, is shaping the future of West Bank and other foreign policy issues, okay. and instead of foreign policy makers? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> where should I begin? <laughs> now, uh, historically speaking, again, uh, Knesset had never been dominated by a single party. Right, the Israeli uh, election law is designed in such a way, and there have been modifications across Israel history, but not big modifications. It's what we call a very representative system. So very small groups can send their representatives to the Knesset, meaning that it's a very divided parliament. Uh, I mean, the, the top runners in the elections would get at most 40 to 45 seats, never more than that. By the way, Knesset has 120 seats. So in order to form a government, you need at least 61. And 61 is shaky, right? You need a little more than that. So Israeli governments have always been coalition governments. There have never been a single party government in Israel since 1948. So under such circumstances, uh, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, it usually goes to the dominant party. The, the party which won the greatest number of seats in the Knesset in the election. Uh, because there are other valuable seats in the cabinet, like the, the, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Education. For example, there are certain cabinet positions that the religious parties would definitely want to have. Ministry of Foreign Affairs in that respect is both highly coveted and at the same time is not of use if you're interested in pulling strings in Israeli economy, right? It's part of high policy. Uh, so I'm not sure if Knesset plays a major role as Knesset. However, Knesset, just like all other parliamentary systems, it works through committees. It has standing committees. And one of those committees is about security and foreign affairs. Mm. That committee has a lot of power. Right? They can summon people. They people need to testify before the committee. By the way, uh, an Arab member, an Arab member, an, an Arab MK member of Knesset was admitted to this committee for the first time in the 1990s. I'm not sure if there had ever been another one since, but it showed the extent to which there was an opening in the 1990s. Because ultimately, top secret stuff is supposedly being discussed at this committee. So that's the only occasion and only forum where Knesset, I believe, can influence foreign policy. But other than that, it's the government. It's the government, it's the military, it's the intelligence. I'm afraid, uh, with all due respect to uh, the charge of the failure, <laughs> the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is somewhat on the back seat in the making of foreign policy. That's my impression. In fact, it's not so much different. <laughs> now, 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 yes. now, yes, it wasn't like that all the time. Uh, um, dear uh, friends, uh, I think it was a very interesting uh, question and answer. Uh, I thank also to those uh, questions uh, put my uh, dear students and uh, viewers. Uh, really, it's very interesting uh, that only some one person was in the Knesset uh, since 90s. I mean, uh, it is how no, we no, not in the Knesset, in the, in the, in, in the committee, the security minimum, yeah, here plays an important role. How security Plays for Israel uh, the role and uh, even the trust within the uh, own citizens. Uh, but just imagine the situation. It's like a Turkish top intelligence service coming and giving the briefing to KJ Pepper. Yes, uh, this, and the connection. This is why uh, I'm talking. Uh, but uh, in American uh, administration, it is different. Uh, 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 for example, in American administration, you can have an Israeli and an, uh, in a Palestinian origin or Iranian origin person uh, uh, becoming uh, uh, one of the uh, members of the committees and they, they, they call themselves, we are all Americans. Uh, so it is a very interesting and different issue. Is why I'm coming to this because after this year, I took uh, our uh, dear uh, friends uh, or my, also my dear friends the former ambassador of Turkey to uh, Israel and America, uh, ambassador, retired ambassador Namak Khan will uh, have the floor. He is the person who will tell us now what uh, Mr. Shaita said and if the right to uh, uh, put until now. Looking from the Turkish foreign policy point of view as uh, Turkish ambassador, um, uh, what 
type of experiences he had uh, uh, when he was serving in Israel and when he was serving in America, from uh, let's say uh, lobby issues to bilateral issues, including just uh, one minute issue. Uh, you know, it is uh, very uh, important where the Turkish Israeli relations uh, started uh, to have the biggest crisis probably ever. So uh, I may uh, invite uh, now. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Nama Khan uh, to have the floor. I'm looking uh, forward really uh, to hear uh, and to listen to him like all of you about his uh, uh, statements about his experiences with his So, uh, uh, Nama do you hear me? Yes, I do. Nama do you hear me? I do hear you. Yes, uh, please, you have the floor. We are looking forward for your presentation. Welcome uh, to our uh, common webinar between the uh, Foreign Policy Institute and uh, Israeli Embassy. We will have in the future also with some uh, many other uh, embassies this type of uh, uh, webinar to inform the uh, intellectual students and public uh, in Turkey in general. So welcome, uh, Mr. Ambassador. I don't need to introduce you more. Uh, because you are so well known, please. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor. Um, thank you for uh, making me part uh, to this uh, wonderful discussion. I greet you all uh, from Çeşme, from the very western end of Turkey. Uh, the weather is awful here, unfortunately, today, but uh, trying to keep away from Corona <laughs> virus. <laughs> That's why we are here. Anyway, hi everybody. Um, uh, it is, uh, as I said, so nice to be with you all today. I uh, am going to speak uh, quite slowly uh, because the quality of uh, uh, the sound is, is uh, awful, unfortunately, uh, Professor. But anyway, uh, I will try to be uh, brief and uh, very slow in order to make uh, people understand. And I want to uh, say hi to uh, my colleague, uh, Ambassador Gilad, uh, also. Thank you uh, for being with us today. Uh, if we, we look at the recent history of Turkish-Israeli uh, relations, we see a very sad picture. Um, everything started to fall apart uh, after 2009, January the 30th, when then Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan was on a panel discussion <laughs> with late President Shimon Peres. Erdogan was very critical about Israel's uh, uh, policies and stormed off uh, uh, the stage on that day, as uh, many of you would remember. I was the Turkish ambassador in Israel then and uh, uh, witnessed uh, firsthand the unfolding of the events. Actually, the relationship had already been hit hard a little earlier when Israel conducted an operation in Gaza almost immediately after a historical meeting between Erdogan and Olmert in Ankara uh, on the, uh, as, as much as I remember on the 22nd of December, 2008. Um, all in all, I can confidently tell you that all met silence and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the phone calls of Erdogan on the mediation efforts of Turkey, followed by an Israeli attack in Gaza during uh, the last few days of 2008, was the real reason behind the breaking of the relationship uh, as uh, I see it. However, the state of affairs between the two countries 
was so different just before this breakage. Abdullah Gül, the then president, was going to pay an official visit to Israel and the presidential uh, advance team had visited Israel for the preparation uh, of the visit already. I remember even the date was fixed as 9th of January 2009 for this visit. The Turkish-Israeli political relations were exemplary at the time for the rest of the regional countries. I can give you countless examples of cooperation and coordination on the political issues, of course. Military relationship was also quite uh, beneficial for both countries. One striking example was Turkey's then purchase of 10 UAVs, uh, Herons, uh, as uh, it's called from Israeli part. Uh, actually, you can see how this transaction transpired itself over Turkey's recent impressive advancement in defense industries. On the economic field, the picture was no different. Uh, actually, economic relations has never been influenced directly by the political climate. During my time as ambassador in 2008, our trade volume was around two, uh, three, uh, uh, 0.4 billion uh, US dollars and our primary objective was to raise this number to 5 billion US dollars in five years. And we did it, despite the unprecedented tension we faced after this decision. In a few years, the volume of trade increased by around 60%, reaching to 5.7 billion. And today, as we speak, the volume of trade between the two countries is around uh, just uh, maybe Ambassador Glad would correct me if I'm wrong, 7.7 .7 billion US dollars. 7.2, yeah. Human to human contacts uh, were incredibly impressive at the time when I was ambassador. <laughs> Almost one tenth of the Israeli population was visiting Turkey every year as tourists at the time. In one specific day, I remember, uh, and it was uh, late August 2008, there were 68 flights from Ben Gurion to different parts of uh, 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 Turkey. 68. Uh, of course, chartered flights uh, were included uh, into this number. And following the infamous encounter between Erdogan and Paris, uh, second blow came in uh, on May 31st, 2010 to the relationship. And I was uh, ambassador in uh, United States then. When, uh, just to remind you, when a flotilla of six Turkish ships led uh, by the Turkish vessel Mavi Marmara tried to breach <laughs> the Gaza embargo, they were stopped by Israeli soldiers. 10 Turkish activists were killed and one Israeli soldier was seriously wounded. This incident undermined all our efforts to mend defenses in our relationship. And uh, what we have done, uh, both sides, after uh, 2009, 
Davos incident uh, was uh, were all collapsed. The reason, I mean, you, you may ask why I am just uh, uh, pointing out to those important uh, uh, points. The reason why I am summarize, summarizing these developments of 10 years ago is that if there is a ray of hope today to revive the relationship, first, we need to understand the reasons behind the rupture in a historical context. It, I think the most serious effect of this lost decade, I mean 2010, 2020, was that it created a loss of confidence between the two nations. Despite this enormous challenge, I am very optimistic about the future of this relationship. Firstly, Turkey-Israeli relationship is a natural one. Turkey is the only Muslim majority country, the one and only Muslim majority country to recognize Israel uh, when Israel was first declared as an independent state in 1949, and I remember after uh, 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 the United States. And we did it on our own uh, uh, decision. We stood up and recognized Israel. We were not offered any kind of assistance of any or, or any favor uh, for our decision. And I would challenge everybody to look uh, into the relationship very carefully. We have no bilateral issues between our two countries whatsoever. We are the only two non-Arab countries in the Middle East other than Iran, as uh, you would know. We have a common historical past and common culture. Turks have ruled Israeli lands and the adjacent region for more than 500 years. Therefore, we know the peoples of the region quite well, and both uh, uh, countries uh, do know each other, as well as the regional uh, people. We can easily say that Turkish and Israeli people are almost carbon copies of each other. I repeat this uh, almost uh, ev in every uh, speech that I make about uh, Israel. And I just underline again, we are carbon copies of each other. Both peoples are very emotional, freaky Mediterraneans, uh, and with short memories. They listen to the same musical tunes and laugh at similar jokes. And shortly, they have more in common than any other society. Israelis, do not travel to and stay in any other country where they do not feel safe. Turkey is one of those rare countries where Israeli, Israelis enjoy their stay. Uh, and historically, uh, the two countries, if you look back, do have an impeccable relationship. Turkish lands have been a refuge uh, to the Jews for hundreds of years. And I would remind again, uh, one single uh, uh, historical fact that the then uh, uh, commander of, of the Ottoman Navy, Kemal Reis, has been sent to Spain 
by Sultan Bayezid II to bring thousands of Jews to Anatolia who were under Spanish Inquisition in the 15th century. We have thousands of Jews who are descendants of those saved from Inquisition. I do not do, uh, uh, need to mention the many number of Jews who have immigrated to Israel from Turkey. Today, uh, as much as I know and remember, there are close to 2,000, 200,000 Turkish Jews living in Israel, more than half of whom carried dual citizenship. I used to call them as the jewels of our society that we have lent to Israel for the enrichment of their diversity. And we have always been proud of them. I have many friends among them, and some are now watching us and listening to us. Majority of uh, them have been educated in best Turkish schools and do speak average four or five foreign languages. They are a big asset for the future of our relationship. Examples that I can give you to show how strong the bonds uh, between the peoples of the two countries. I just wanted to make a short list of reasons why I think and firmly believe that the voice of reason will soon be heard by the politicians of both countries. And they will, I hope, start taking steps in bringing back the relationship to its deserved level. Unlike I most countries, in our region, both Turkey and Israel are free, open markets with rule-based trading mechanisms. So Turkey's political relations with Russia or Iran may impact its trade with those countries, but not Turkish-Israeli trade relations. They are fairly isolated from the sudden change of uh, mind of the country's leaders. I mean, speaking about Turkey and Israel. Although economic relations did also take a hit, I'm pretty sure about very promising results in the long term. The same is true for the from Ambassador Gilad. For instance, this year, there are reports that in addition to Antalya's summer allure, Istanbul is now considered as a destination for winter vacation. The data confirms that things are improving. After the Davos incident in 2009, the number of tourists visiting Turkey declined by around 45% to roughly 300,000. When I left uh, Israel in 2008, the figure was 638,000 a year, I mean that year. After Mavi Marmara in 2010, it declined to around 100,000. But this year, the number of Israeli tourists in Turkey has once again, they say, I mean, according to reports, peaked to about 500,000. It's also good to see Israeli tourists back in Turkey after almost a decade past. 
it means that confidence is back on Israeli side. Presently, there are, again, uh, it could be corrected, 14 daily flights of the Turkish Airlines to Tel Aviv, and all are always fully booked. As I said earlier, there is a steady improvement in the trade and investment side of the relationship. In the last uh, two years, as I uh, read and see, for instance, the volume of trade has reached to, as I said earlier, again, 7.7 .7 billion recently. I think this figure can easily hit 10 billion dollar mark in, in one or two years time, and the gains could be substantial for both countries. If you consider the volume of trade between the United States and Turkey, uh, the, the United States being 330 million uh, uh, people in population, uh, as uh, around 20 billion, then you would understand how important this uh, figure is. And don't forget that this figure has always been uh, uh, positively on Turkey's side. On the other hand, the Turkish industry needs a technological jump and the discussion on this sometimes feels locked between the European and Asian nations, but there is a deep well of uh, investment and technology in the region, and this well to be tapped is in Israel. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what is the main obstacle before the full recovery of the bilateral relationship? This is the question that we have. We have every great ingredient for remaking it uh, uh, or bringing it back to its previous uh, 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 level. But there are, there are some obstacles. And actually to me, I mean, in my opinion, there is only one obstacle. I think the ailing part of this relationship is the political relations. There are chronic problems to be solved through pragmatic engagement. I underline this uh, uh, two words, pragmatic engagement between high level politicians. There are, in my view, three immediate steps uh, that are, uh, I mean, need to be taken uh, in the coming days. First, the relationship has to be saved from being hostage to the Palestinian issue, which is uh, very difficult, of course. Second, ideological chains on the relationship should be unshackled. Third, meaningful diplomatic relationship should be re-established as early as possible. Is it easy to take these steps if the very top political leaders of the two countries, no need to name names, you would know who they are, decide to listen to the voice of the reason and come to terms with the real politics of the region, these steps could be taken in a split second. If not, I'm afraid both countries will continue to lose uh, big every passing day. Before I conclude, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would urge 
the top political decision makers of the two countries, just to imagine, for example, what the situation in Eastern Mediterranean would be like if we didn't have this lost decade in our relationship. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Ambassador, uh, thank you very much, Frida. It is uh, so important what you talk to us now. Uh, I would call it historic uh, webinar, uh, talking about this, uh, having all these backgrounds uh, from your eyes, your perspective. And definitely, uh, when you uh, talked about uh, already 500 years, uh, the Jewish presence in the Ottoman Empire from 1492 uh, until today, there is uh, 500 years celebrations. I mean, in 1992, we all uh, in Turkey at that time, we had good relations that uh, participated. And the Turkish uh, Prime Minister, Councillor Chilas, visit to Israel was uh, one of the best uh, uh, events uh, what could happen since 1949 what, when Turkey recognized uh, Israel. Ambassador Onur Gökçe was uh, the first ambassador after so many years to be appointed there. And uh, what is more important, in the 90s, Israel was the primary uh, supporter of Turkey against the fight of PKK terrorism. Uh, Israel uh, signed a lot of uh, uh, cross-border terrorism agreements with Turkey. And uh, what is more uh, important, uh, in 2002, just before the uh, uh, coalition government uh, uh, gave the power to uh, today's uh, government, um, in the last minute, the defense minister, Sabahattin Çakmakoğlu, signed $850 million contract with Israel. This Anatolian Eagle uh, program uh, in Konya, which has been serving uh, for uh, military uh, training for Israeli forces, has been uh, very important. And uh, what is important, uh, uh, maybe also the Turkish military at the moment are very well watched in Israel. So there is uh, a big uh, interest, of course, uh, back. And uh, maybe for the uh, students, uh, uh, the uh, most important publication by uh, George uh, Bernard Shaw and Ezel uh, Kral Shaw about the uh, Jewish in uh, Ottoman Empire and in Turkey. This is a work of 36 years, uh, uh, and this is uh, one of the basic uh, publications, uh, I would say. And what you said is interesting, uh, the tourism in uh, uh, Turkey in the 90s, that every uh, six person from uh, Israel at least once we came in Turkey was very interesting. 68 flights in one day, it is uh, 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 one of the biggest uh, developments. And what is more important, uh, I was also uh, uh, in boardroom in, uh, in Antalya uh, where the Israeli tourists were a lot like World of Wonders, uh, this uh, uh, summer uh, 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 places have been uh, uh, full of uh, Israeli uh, Tourists. But what you said is interesting, 200,000 uh, Jewish uh, people uh, emigrated from Turkey to Israel since 1940s, uh, actually, since 45, 46, 47. Uh, my city is uh, Edirne, by the way, and uh, there is uh, uh, there was a big uh, community of the uh, Jewish uh, people, and the biggest uh, synagogue in the Balkans is in Edirne was opened in 2015, and it was opened by Bilant Arendt. Uh, at that time, he was uh, uh, the, representing the uh, government, and uh, more than 1,000 people uh, it can uh, contain. And what is uh, more interesting, what you uh, gave us here, uh, I would say, also uh, this uh, two-term pragmatic, uh, 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 pragmatic engagement is very interesting political, uh, I would say, uh, terminus technical, and all the voice of the reason and real politics in the region. I'm a realist, so, uh, my students know this, so uh, I uh, suggest always to be realistic and uh, pragmatic. And uh, what is uh, uh, more important, you use the word, I urge the political uh, leaders uh, to listen uh, to this. And I think they listen to you, probably, 
because in recent days, <laughs> in recent days, uh, uh, Turkish uh, Secret Intelligence Service Director uh, Hakan Fidan is already negotiating and talking to the Israeli side. This is uh, in all the press uh, we can uh, follow. So probably there, there is something to happen uh, to recognize that Turkey and Israel are two Mediterranean uh, countries. At least the people eat the same fish from Mediterranean, maybe in this respect. For the students, uh, maybe uh, I would suggest one more book uh, by uh, Denio Pinto. Uh, Denio Pinto was uh, the head of uh, a Jewish community in Turkey in 2009. The, uh, the book published by Doan Yayindulit, Türkiye de bir Yahudinin Yaşamı. Uh, in, uh, in English, it is a life of, of a Turkish Jew. When I read, uh, when I read this book, uh, I saw uh, how uh, it is important here in Turkey also to have Jewish lobby, uh, if you want. Uh, Mr. Pinto was meeting everyone, uh, including now President Tayyip uh, Erdogan. He met him uh, in his house. Uh, they met when he was mayor of Istanbul, of course. They, uh, they had a lot of meetings. And there is an, an anecdote. Uh, he said, this man is much more connected than myself, he said. Uh, when uh, Tayyip Erdogan was uh, uh, getting a telephone call and talking to the American uh, president. It's very interesting. Professor, uh, professor. To read. By the way, Denita P Denio Pinto was a Galatasaray uh, professor, player uh, and uh, I'm can a I... Galatasaray uh, supporter. Now, uh, Mr. Ambassador, we can go, we can go now to uh, question and answer period. Uh, I think there will be a lot of questions uh, directed to you. Uh, definitely, and uh, looking forward to is going to put the first uh, question. Uh, 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 professor. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Gilad uh, said uh, he just gives a couple of minutes uh, from the Israeli side, uh, the views, and then you open the Q&A. Uh, uh, professor, uh, professor. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Uh, just allow me to uh, tell you uh, a little anecdote uh, yeah. about Bension Pinto. Yeah. Bension is a very close and uh, uh, a good friend of mine, as uh, perhaps he is to you. One day he came to visit us in Israel. I was ambassador then, and he was actually called there, invited there to participate in a wedding ceremony. Mm -hmm. And we were seated together, side by side. After a while, his phone rang, his cellular phone. And he just responded to the phone by saying, yes, Mr. Prime Minister. This was his answer. And then he walked away. I couldn't hear the rest of what he said or uh, he responded. Then he came back after a while and I asked him, said, Bansion, which prime minister are, are you talking about? I mean, you are, uh, uh, I heard that you were uh, saying prime minister. He said, of course, our prime minister. I said, what is your prime minister? He said, your prime minister is my prime minister. It is Recep Tayyip Erdogan. I was shocked uh, and I was taken aback. Why? Because he had the direct communication and direct number uh, of the Prime Minister of Turkey as the representative of uh, the, the highest representative of Turkey in Israel, I did not have that number. I could, of course, reach then to uh, the Prime Minister, but I should use some uh, uh, middle people to reach him. So he was he was uh, really an impeccable person. I just uh, what you said about him and his book, and I read it. Uh, it's very interesting and I advise everyone to take one copy from that book. 
he is uh, he has uh, had a great service to our relationship and mm -hmm. i want to uh, uh, just uh, uh, remember him uh, because i i believe uh, he is a bit sick uh, nowadays so i uh, i uh, wish him speedy recovery as well Yes, uh, I didn't know him personally, uh, Ambassador, but I read the book. Uh, so, uh, and uh, also uh, several anecdotes, of course, and uh, definitely he was one of the most important contributors uh, between Turkey and uh, Israel uh, for the uh, good relations. And now, uh, Mr. Uh, ambassador, for me, he's Ambassador. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador is uh, Speaking a couple of minutes about uh, about uh, uh, the event from Israeli point of view, then we have uh, the question and answer period. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much, Hussein, uh, Ambassador Namiktan. Uh, I, I hope everybody can hear me. I try to speak yeah, as uh, clear as I can. Ambassador Namiktan, I, I see you're not in your head, so you can hear me clearly, <laughs> sir. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very I much. I do hear you. I do hear you very well. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I see that it's not a legend that Turkey sends its best ambassadors to Israel yes. in the past and hopefully in the future as well. You gave a very uh, uh, brilliant uh, short presentation. Yes, uh, I want to leave time for questions and I think our time is due by one o'clock. So let me just say briefly uh, to reflect from an Israeli point of view on your, uh, on your uh, wise remarks. First of all, let me, I, I, I do depict the relationship between Israel and Turkey as a, some islands of, of cooperation, of participation within an ocean of abnormal relationship. Now, I count uh, five islands like that. Some of them you mentioned, some of them were not mentioned. First of all, you mentioned the trade, indeed, in 2019, we are talking about $7.2 billion going both ways, most of it going from Turkey to Israel, $5.5 billion of Turkish export to Israel against only $1.7 billion of Israeli export to Turkey. This is a, a very, a very significant island, such island, and let us hope that it will recover in 2021 after the COVID-19. A second island is the tourism. As you mentioned, in 2019, we had half a million Israelis came over here. I learned from you that in the past there were 620,000 in the years before the Mavi Marmara. So the numbers are nearly back to where it was before. Uh, Turkish Airlines actually is the second biggest uh, uh, tour operator in Israel. Can how you hear um can mm -hmm. you hear us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's that's another indicator that this, what I call the island of tourism, is a, is a significant island. The third one is the construction. Turkey is known for a excellent a construction companies. At least one of them is working now in Israel as we speak, Il Mizlar, with 1,200 people there, that basically their salary goes directly to Turkey and feed their families. And as the head of Il Mizlar says, uh, they are proud to shape the sky outline of Tel Aviv, and they are doing a wonderful job, not only in Tel Aviv, in many places. Uh, a fourth uh, island of cooperation, which you didn't mention and needs to be mentioned, uh, uh, is the, that all the trade now between Turkey and Jordan goes through Israel, through Haifa. It used to go mm -hmm. through trucks, through, uh, with trucks through Syria, but it's not relevant anymore since the war in Syria. And now all your trade with Jordan go from Mersin to Haifa on Roro boats and then going to uh, crossing Israel to Beit Sheyan checkpoint, going to Jordan and coming back. This is another important island. And the fifth one, maybe we, we don't speak about it enough, but maybe it's the most important one. It is what I call the people to people. So obviously culture, you know, uh, in Israel, Turkish uh, television series like yeah. The Bride from Istanbul are very <laughs> popular. But under this uh, roof of the people to people, the fifth island I would put also, and you mentioned it, uh, Namiktan, the Jewish community of Turkey. The 200,000 Turks that immigrated to Israel and the 15,000 Jewish Turks that live here are working day in and day out 
to improve and to amend the relationship between Turkey and Israel. So uh, you, you mentioned uh, before uh, uh, um, uh, Professor Ilker uh, issues of uh, double loyalty. This has nothing to do with the Jewish community here, nor with the uh, Turkish Jewish community in Israel. Those people are the pioneers of the relationship. And if indeed, if indeed there will be amendment and there will be improvement and the relationship will go back to normality, those people will have an important share in the amendment of the relationship. I really salute them. They are wonderful people and they are working again day in and day out to repair the relationship. Now, so far we spoke about the islands. Let's say a word about the sea which is around the island. The political relationship, as you referred to it at the end of your presentation, and Amik, indeed, there the situation is not good. That has to be said. The last 10 years since the Mavi Marmara, or if you want, the 11 years since the divorce incident, uh, did not make any good to the relationship. Relationship are stressed, are not good. The message that I have to the uh, my Turkish friends, and I have plenty of friends here, is that normal relationship with Israel will make Turkey much more relevant to the Palestinian issue than not having normal relationship with Israel. You have to have <clears throat> normal relationship with both sides in order to be relevant. Just like Egypt is doing in Gaza, <clears throat> just like uh, 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 Jordan is doing in the West Bank. And you will see that very soon UAE and Bahrain that have now established normal relationship with Israel will become more relevant to the Palestinian cause that states that boycott Israel, unfortunately, like, like, like Turkey. In that sense, I will lean on what you said, Namik, that relations should not be hostage. The if you can just close the, uh, the unmute yourself, whoever is speaking, other than myself. Um, I, I'm afraid that currently the relationship between Israel and Turkey, from the Turkish point of view, are indeed hostage to the, uh, to the um, Palestinian issue. And let me just conclude by saying this. Uh, you said, uh, Namik, and I don't want, it's a Turkish issue, that there, is, there are many people in Turkey that would like to see normalization of the relationship. But I don't know what does the people who set the agenda think about it. I, have, I don't have much access to them. The Israeli portfolio is somewhere uh, else. And I don't know uh, the, the people who decides for the relationship with Israel. I, I really don't know what they think about Israel. But let me say just this. If indeed, if indeed there will be a decision here in Ankara, because it's for Ankara to decide because Ankara sent our ambassador back to Jerusalem, which is the capital of Israel. Uh, it will not be just by uh, announcing that everything is okay, out of the blue. Uh, there are some things that Turkey will need to fulfill. And let me here mention only one thing, which is the relationship with the Hamas. Uh, from our point of view, Hamas is as, as dangerous as the PKK for you. Uh, uh, Professor Ilker spoke about one of the difficulties of Israel of lack of uh, uh, strategic depth. Uh, every missile which is being launched from Gaza can bring the life in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem to a standstill. That's not a situation that we are willing to take. So whenever uh, you hear about the Hamas, I suggest you think about PKK. It is the same dangerous thing Hamas would like to eliminate presence of Jewish sovereignty in the Middle East, hence Israel. We can hardly hear anything. We can't hear. Can you hear us now? Okay. Israel, Israel takes it. Israel, is it okay? Israel, I'll try to speak uh, more clearly. Israel takes this uh, warm relationship between Turkey and Hamas very seriously. This is not going to be the only thing, but this is one thing that Turkey will have to change if indeed Turkey is to normalize the relationship with Israel. Let me end in a positive way. I think this normalization will bring benefit to both states. Uh, we didn't speak about uh, the East Med. If there will be a question about it, I will refer to it. I think both sides will agree for that. 
but there is a lot of room to be done, mainly from Ankara, in order indeed to amend the relationship. Thank you very much. And uh, now, uh, Mr. Ambassador uh, Nahmoud Tam, we have the questions uh, directed to you. Uh, first, uh, with, uh, we start with Shumal Azuri, and then uh, continue with Noura Dal Shurufi and Ali Zriya. So, um, with Shumal. Uh, thank you for your speech, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, in one of your recent writings, you define today's Turkey as a lonely island. In your opinion, can we portray Turkish diplomacy in respect to Israel case is a failure? And if so, what is the major problem in today's Turkish foreign policy? Thank you. Very good. Bravo. The question was uh, too Yeah. Uh, Shumali, thank you for your question. Well, yes, <clears throat> unfortunately, in recent uh, years, uh, Turkey has got uh, uh, lonely, not only in the region, but uh, uh, globally as well. This is so sad. And I believe uh, the reasons behind it uh, actually is known to everybody. Uh, it's very clear. I don't want to go into details because uh, I'm not a politician and I'm a diplomat, so I should uh, uh, stay in, in some boundaries. But I think ideological, uh, uh, I think tones in our foreign policy is, uh, is uh, much more, uh, I think, evident uh, in, in recent years, uh, first and foremost. And the second one is, that we have uh, uh, we have uh, i think forgot about forgotten about the uh, 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 soft power of this this country but rather uh, replaced it with some uh, uh, some hard power that is not going to uh, go and work in this region not only in this region but nowhere I think uh, we should uh, again go back to uh, days where we were mediating, for instance, with Israel and Syria, and I was uh, a part of this uh, uh, that med mediation effort. I know how it worked. Uh, uh, I think positively for uh, not only for Turkey, uh, for Turkey's image, but also for Israel, for the region for uh, the whole uh, uh, world, I, I, I should say. So uh, that's what I can do. I mean, what I can uh, do only just voice out my message is that uh, we have to uh, start using our soft power in order to get uh, our relationship with uh, our uh, natural uh, 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 neighbors and partners like Israel uh, normalized. Thank you, Ambassador. Now we have uh, Noor Adal Shurufi. Do you hear me, Noor? Yes. Please, uh, you are on the line. Thank you. So I'm um, considering Turkey's uh, um, arguably hypocritical stance of recognizing Hamas as a political authority while at the same time maintaining uh, ties with Israel. Um, do you think, and also considering that Turkey has started to cut off ties um, after the recent recognition from Arab countries, um, that in the near future, under the current uh, uh, political party uh, heading Turkey, that there is any hope for uh, reestablishing this tie unless, say, uh, Israel were to, say, um, cease its annexation of the West Bank or anything of the sort under uh, the current presidency of Turkey? So. Well, uh, uh, it's a difficult question. Thank you for the question, but it's difficult to answer. Uh, actually, uh, I believe uh, the, uh, uh, the, the president uh, himself, I know him. I have been 
on many occasions, uh, you know, advising him. And, uh, I know how he thinks. He is the most pragmatic person I have ever seen uh, in the face of the earth. So uh, uh, what I can tell you, uh, if you ask my view about this, I think he can take that step and he can uh, do what you have said. Uh, when, I don't know. I feel like uh, um, it won't be in the, uh, in the uh, near future, but uh, at the end of the day, I think he knows how important uh, uh, Turkey's relationship with Israel. Uh, he himself, I know him. I told you the, uh, why I told you the anecdote that I have lived uh, with uh, Ben Sion Pinto to show you how he is close to uh, the Turkish Jews, but also the, the, the Jewish world and uh, how he is keen in uh, responding to their, addressing uh, their needs. So I believe uh, he will take that step uh, but when, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, good uh, answer, uh, because uh, indeed the Israeli lobby in America in the early 2002, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, until the, <laughs> uh, until uh, uh, that was incident, uh, it was a very strong support uh, from the Israeli lobby uh, towards Turkey. Even uh, the membership uh, discussions, uh, candidacy to European Union, was uh, supported by Israel uh, very strongly. And when he was mayor, uh, president, when he was mayor in Istanbul, of course, he had uh, very strong uh, relations with all uh, over the world uh, Jewish because he was, uh, uh, as mayor uh, of Istanbul, uh, also connected world worldwide uh, to several uh, cities. So he knows uh, Israel very well. And he was actually uh, one who said, who was also taken uh, from the Israeli uh, groups, uh, the medal, uh, in order to improve the Turkish-Israeli relations, Ambassador, you know this. Uh, professor, uh, uh, professor, I think uh, uh, one, I mean, if I may add a few more points, I invested uh, three thirds of my career to Turkish-US relations. I know uh, this relationship, talking about Turkish uh, or Turkey US, in the last uh, 30 years, I started in 1990, when many of you were not in this world. Uh, so I invested again, 30, almost 30 years of my career. So uh, uh, I know what benefits we have driven from uh, our triangular relationship. I mean, Turkey, Israel, and the United States. Uh, if you look at this triangular relationship, when there is a problem in one angle, it reflects itself in the region as a bigger problem. Now, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we have problems in three, uh, all three angles of this problem. So you should understand how complicated the things are today. Right. Uh, we have uh, several uh, problems in our relationship with the United States, which I have never seen in the past. I mean, the magnitude of which I have never seen in the last uh, 30 years uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the United States uh, and Turkish relationship. And the same is true yeah. almost. I mean, we have, we have had always ups and downs uh, uh, with Israel, but again, this relationship is, uh, is uh, uh, I think, perhaps better than what we have <laughs> with the US today. So I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is that we, we need to uh, put this triangular relationship into 
its uh, right place uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Now we have two uh, more questions and then uh, time will be over, uh, probably. Now, first we have uh, Assistant Professor Ali Duruz from Tob University and then uh, Evren Gunan Ambassador. These two, uh, two questions, please take note and then uh, give a general framework and then we will have closing remarks. So, uh, Ali Diroz, uh, do you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, perfect. Uh, you have the floor. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. And um, uh, my question, um, hello, Mr. Ambassador Tan, so good to see you again. And uh, to Jarj Daper Roy Gilad, Professor Baje. Um, we talked about, uh, we often talk about um, regional challenges and um, how the triangular relationship uh, between Turkey and the United States and Israel is right now having its issues. However, we, uh, Sharjah Dafer Gilad also mentioned other uh, opportunities. For, for instance, how even today, uh, is, uh, the port of Haifa is being used to uh, promote trade um, to, to Jordan, to other regions. Now, my question is, are there any other prospects, would you say, uh, uh, for um, third, par third party or third region cooperation between Turkey and Israel, in spite of political tensions, but especially for, from a political economic perspective. And the example I was uh, particularly uh, thinking the case is, would you think there would be such an opportunity for the Caucasus, for example, in Azerbaijan? Uh, Thank Good you. question. Uh, you put the question in the last minute, in the most uh, crucial one, actually. <laughs> but uh, I like it. I like it. It is a very good question. And now Evran Gönel is the last uh, uh, one who will put the question. Yes, uh, Evran. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for your uh, valuable opinions and contribution to our uh, meeting. Uh, in a current situation, we see uh, the differences uh, between the Israel and Turkey and generally overcome the similarities. Uh, for example, the soft power issues. And can the uh, smart power, which is a combination of soft power and hard power, be a solution for the relationship, for the future relationship between the two countries? Ambassador, uh, if you answer the questions in five minutes, <laughs> it would be great. <laughs> well, I, I will try. First of all, <clears throat> uh, you call uh, Ali Dirius, but I call Oz Dirius because his name is uh, uh, Ali Oz Dirius, <laughs> and I know him from his uh, childhood. <laughs> He's, uh, uh, a son of our, uh, one of our dear colleagues, Hussein Rios. Uh, I remembered when we were talk, uh, working together with Hussein uh, uh, in 1990s uh, to make uh, um, Turkish-American relationship uh, uh, better. Um, having said that, uh, uh, I think uh, I tried to enumerate the number of areas that we have uh, uh, that we can easily, uh, I think, uh, promote uh, and develop and uh, enlarge, expand our relationship, uh, OWS. Uh, many of them are also, uh, I think, highlighted by Ambassador Gilad. Uh, so I don't want to go into those details, but. One of the most important uh, uh, point is if I were to start normalizing this relationship, I would, uh, I think, focus on technological partnership. Uh, this is, uh, I think, crucially important for the future of Turkey uh, as well as uh, Israel, but I would give a priority to this uh, among other things. Uh, of course. Um, coming to Evren's uh, question, uh, just remind me, Evren, what was the question? Uh, 
Yani okay. Ee, can smart power yani which is yeah, combine yeah. which is combine yeah. you uh, remember that? Course, okay. I mean, uh, you can use any other power uh, than uh, the hard power. <laughs> Uh, whether you call it a soft power or smart power doesn't matter, but uh, I think we are losing time. We are losing time. This relationship uh, is uh, waiting uh, to be on tap. I mean, uh, we should do it as early as possible. And unfortunately, no one is able to unlock the luck Uh, if the politicians do not let us uh, to do that job, we have to do it. I mean, they have to do it. If they allow us to work uh, as they did before, because uh, ma many of the institutions are not there anymore, including the uh, the foreign ministry. Unfortunately, uh, I, I'm uh, really. Uh, I'm uh, very upset to say this, but I think that, that that's a fact. So as early as possible, I think uh, we should uh, be let uh, to unlock that lock. And it's, uh, it's going to be very easy. In terms of Israel-Turkish relationship, believe me, uh, we can do it in a, in a, in a few weeks or even uh, in a few days. Thank you. Ambassador, uh, thank you very much. Uh, exactly at 1 uh, p.m. we finished uh, the official uh, uh, part of it. But uh, before um, we uh, make closing uh, remarks, uh, just give me a couple of minutes uh, to Mr. Ambassador, then I will uh, close officially the session. Ambassador, you have the uh, floor. Thank you, Hussein. Thank you, Namik, again for the... By the way, can you hear me well? And Namik, you will be able yes. to talk yes. Yes. slowly and, uh, and loudly. Uh, I'll say this. As I said before, at the, beginning of my, uh, at the beginning of the day, I believe that eventually relationships are being decided by interest. That's the most important thing. I do think that Israel and Turkey has a lot of mutual interest. One interest that was uh, uh, spoken here, but I don't think that should lead the list. It's mainly a Turkish interest to lean on to enjoy the power of the Jewish lobby in the United States. I think, Hussein, there is some exaggeration uh, about this issue. It's more a Jewish-American issue. Uh, again, without getting into too many details, I think there are some other portfolios which are more significant and more important than the Jewish lobby in the United States. And those are mainly the following portfolios. First of all, Syria. I said it before, I'm saying it now, and I'll say it in the future. I think basically the lack of stability in Syria is the problem for you and for us. And at the end of the day, you and us are facing the same enemies in Syria, mainly Iran and its proxies, the Hezbollah who are challenging you in the north of Syria, challenging us in the south of Syria. And when the day will come and we'll have normal relationship, I think Syria, the situation in Syria might be the first chapter of the discussion between the two sides. Second chapter as uh, my friend, Dr. Ali De Rios, that I don't know him from childhood, but I know him <laughs> for the last one and a half year, mentioned and this is the energy. Much can done, be done between the two states on the field of energy. Uh, again, energy can and should be a source of a partnership, a bridge, and not only a source of conflict. Uh, the third issue is something that you mentioned, Amiktan. Uh, currently, the trade between the two countries is around $7.2 billion. That can be up to $10 billion. Uh, and I think the way to uh, upgrade it is move by moving from <coughs> low tech to high tech. All this is possible, all this is doable. The decision is in Ankara again, but in order to normalize the relationship, it's not only about pushing a button, calling Jerusalem and believing that that will solve all the problem. Ankara knows exactly what needs to be done in order to amend, to normalize the relationship. 
There is no use to repeat it here. I do it in other places. But when Ankara will reach the right decision and will be willing to pay, if you wish, the price to normalize the relationship and bring them back to the place it should be, I believe that this will serve the interest of Turkey and also the interest of Israel. And I thank you very much, Sir, for giving me this platform. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, I thank also uh, to uh, Ambassador Dr. Reiter and to Ambassador Mahmoud Khan. You can see how we have been uh, discussing uh, Israel from uh, different uh, perspectives. As uh, Turkish Foreign Policy Institute, uh, we are independent uh, institute. Uh, we will further in future bring uh, uh, different uh, countries to different uh, we do not hear you. And uh, this is, um, yes, uh, you hear now. We will, as uh, Turkish Foreign Policy, as an independent uh, research institute, we will have also in the future further events uh, like this. And since three hours, we have been debating Israel. It is one of our most important, I would say, uh, activities in order to bring at least two sides, uh, as Mr. Namutan called, to reasoning, uh, to uh, common uh, sense, and that the Turkey and Israel are two uh, important uh, countries in this part of the world, uh, which is imperative that they cooperate together despite all the existing uh, challenges and uh, problems. But uh, as Foreign Policy Institute, uh, we will uh, once again uh, further uh, expect you to participate in our uh, activities and uh, for those who have been listening to us uh, and also putting the questions, uh, very interesting questions, uh, by the way. I thank you all of them. As we say, don't go away, stay with us. We will be back with uh, further uh, activities. And I thank you all uh, for this wonderful event and uh, participation. Thank you very much. I wish you a very fruitful week and keep in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.